Guatemala. We'll hear from human rights organizations and activists. Congressman Stephen Horn chaired a nearly four-hour hearing. A uh, quorum being present, the Subcommittee on Government Management, Information and Technology come to order. We're here today to review the information security policies and the practices of the executive branch of the United States government. There's broad agreement that the government needs to safeguard sensitive information in the interests of both national security and individual safety. At the same time, there are often compelling for allowing the public to access classified information. H.R. 2635, the Human Rights Information Act, presents Congress with the challenge of balancing these competing interests. Many questions are raised by the These include whether the government needs to make fundamental changes to declassification and to classification generally. What role administrative costs and burdens should play in setting that policy? approach, targeted requests or broad and systemic efforts would provide the most fair and effective declassification policy. We should also consider these information policies from the perspective of the individual requester. I can recall our hearing two years ago when we were shocked to learn that it takes four years for the average citizen to get a copy of his or her file from the Federal Bureau of Investigation. I very strongly that when agencies take that long, they should be asking the president for resources to get access to those files. That's as much of their government obligation as many other things we do. For individuals so they can see it if there are errors in the file and this kind of thing. What is the current process to requesting classified information from the government is one of our questions. What barriers are commonly encountered? Are in is able to obtain requested information in a timely manner to satisfactory explanations when the information is not declassified. Do the channels appealing declassification decisions provide affordable, timely, and fair review? Our first panel will address the provisions of H.R. 2635. The bill specifically provides a process for declassifying on an expedited basis government documents relating human rights abuses in Guatemala and Honduras. We hear about the events that motivated this bill. Why does it focus on these two countries? As the information is being recorded. These countries are in the process of overcoming decades of internal rights in an attempt to establish an accurate historical record and to secure the rule of law. These countries have established human rights and historical classification offices. We representatives from these offices to testify before us this morning. They may help understand the recent and very unwelcome development. Monsignor Auxiliary Bishop of the Archdiocese of Guatemala was assassinated one week ago on Sunday, May 3rd. This assassination came days after Monsignor Gerardi presided over the release of a report on human rights violations in Guatemala. The second panel will focus on the process of requesting information from the government and the importance of an effective declassification program. Finally, we will hear from the administration on both the specific issues raised by H.R. 2635 and the broader subjects of classification and declassification policy. The views of the administration, particularly the agencies to which these information requests have been made, are essential to a full and balanced consideration of this bill. I'm disappointed to announce, therefore, that two very important agencies we invited to this hearing refused to appear. And we gave them plenty of notice. They knew this was coming. They originally said they would appear. The refusal of the Department and State and the Department of Justice to go on the record is mystifying, to say the least. 
the Department of State has refused to appear because they were not allowed to testify first and then leave before any non-governmental witnesses testify. My opinion on this as well as other departments is the Department of State and other agencies should come after we hear from the witnesses and the witnesses could tell them something they might learn if they'd stop to listen. The Department of Justice has informed the subcommittee staff that they could not receive clearance from the Office of Management and Budget in time for the hearing. When our staff checked with OMB last week to see if they'd turned in any testimony, guess what? They hadn't, so don't blame the Office of Management for not clearing it. Now, at quarter of 10 this morning, the Department of State issued a letter to us, and we will file that in the record at the end of my remarks. And without objection, it will be put in right here. And, uh, of course, that isn't the point. Anybody can file a letter with any congressional committee in a hit-and-run operation, but we want a dialogue. And we think these people should come up here and listen to you and listen to members of the committee on both sides of the aisle who have strong feelings on this subject. And then let's get a dialogue and see where we are from there on. But as far as I'm concerned, the Department of Justice, and we'll hold a special hearing. If we have to subpoena them, we'll subpoena them. But uh, that's justice and state and their contribution to this morning's dialogue. I'm now delighted to yield to my colleague, uh, the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Kucinich. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Chairman Horn. I, I just received this letter from the, uh, one of the departments. I suppose it's relevant to this. So It's State, I assume. Uh, state Department, same letter, letter that you have, where I take it they're uh, justifying their refusal to come here this morning. Well, in any event, I, I just uh, want to go on record as saying that um, I would support the uh, chair in any effort to subpoena uh, either the State Department or the Justice Department to uh, testify on this matter. I think it's, uh, um, it does not bode well for this overall subject. Two of the important departments for getting answers on these uh, questions before us today have uh, essentially refused to cooperate with this committee. And again, I want those departments to know if they have any representatives here uh, sitting in the audience or watching uh, that I will support the chair's efforts to issue subpoenas. So you're not going to escape accountability. Uh, today we are considering legislation introduced by my respected colleague, Mr. Lantos. I'm a co-supporter of this bill because I think it's time that the U.S. government come clean on a sad chapter in our history. We're privileged to have as witnesses individuals who have dedicated their lives on human rights and who will be explaining the need for this legislation. In particular, I'd like to welcome Dr. Leo Vallardes, uh, Vallardes, I think is the way it's pronounced, the Honduran Human Rights Ombudsman, and Mr. Federico Reyes of the Guatemalan Archbishop's Office of Human Rights, both of whom have traveled a great deal to testify before the subcommittee. Both uh, Dr. Vallardes and Mr. Reyes are dedicated to uncovering the truth and bringing human rights abusers to justice. Uh, I think their work ought to be fully supported, and people who work on human rights investigations do so at grave personal risk to themselves and their loved ones. Many of the individuals here today, and many others not present, routinely jeopardize their own safety to bring peace to others who have suffered greatly. The world is, uh, does take note and will stand behind your work. The hidden truth about state-sponsored killings in Central America continues to cause widespread injustice. Two high-ranking Salvadoran military commanders were allowed to move to the U.S. in 1983. Ten years later, the El Salvador U.N. Truth Commission found that the same two military official, officials had covered up the brutal slaying of four American nuns in 1980. The U.S. ambassador to El Salvador at the time of the murders, quote, knew immediately it was the military, unquote, and found it difficult to accept that the U.S. government was not aware that these men were all guilty of either ordering or then covering up the killing. I make this a note, Mr. Chairman, because I personally knew Sister Dorothy Kazel, and it is shocking that our government may have knowingly aided former Salvadoran military officials who likely ordered her murder, and that three other... Uh, sisters, all American citizens, uh, were also murdered. I'm offended and outraged that these men live in the United States and have not been held accountable. 
The U.S. government trained and financed military and intelligence units to fight governments and leftist insurgents in Central America. The U.S. amassed mountains of classified information on the political and military leaders of El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras, with whom we developed close relationships. These same political and military officials committed horrible human rights violations with impunity, protected by their American connections. Victims of human rights abuses in Central America need the information contained in the files of the Department of Defense, the CIA, and the State Department. To them, the information is a matter of life, death, and dignity. It would provide some closure to the families of the victims and help build the foundations for an accountable military and civilian government by bringing those responsible for crimes to justice. And it may prevent future bloodshed. Bishop Harardi founded the Guatemalan Archbishop's Office on Human Rights in 1994. Just two weeks ago, he was murdered in his own garage, his head crushed by a cement block. Bishop Harardi had just released a report called Guatemala, Never Again, on human rights violations during its 36-year civil war. His death was designed to threaten public confidence in the peace accord, to intimidate those who seek truth, and warn Guatemalans that the horrors may not be over. The New York Times reports that many in Guatemala fear that the government is covering up his murder and framing someone else. The statistics from the Archbishop's report are staggering. Almost one million government and military officials were involved in human rights abuses. Over 150,000 Guatemalans died or disappeared during the violence and the military and police were responsible for over 80% of these crimes. The report documented 422 massacres and compiled testimony on 55,000 murders, disappearances, tortures, rapes, assaults, and kidnappings. In releasing his report, Bishop Harardi emphasized that, quote, we cannot distort history, nor should we silence the truth. It is a truth that challenges each one of us to recognize our individual and collective responsibility and commit ourselves to action so that these abominable acts must never happen again. Bishop Harardi drew on the Cain and Abel story from Genesis, asking, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. Much blood has been shed upon the ground in Guatemala. The stories from Honduras are just as tragic. Honduran mothers gather over grave sites to find their children. As one mother noted, my son was not there, but these are the sons of someone. The Baltimore Sun published a four-part series on U.S. military and intelligence activities in Honduras. The series focused on Battalion 316, a military counterintelligence unit trained and funded by the CIA. According to the Sun, 24-year-old Inés Consuelo Morillo was tied, hung naked from a ceiling, and beaten repeatedly by members of Battalion 316. Her tormentors nearly drowned her and frequently electrocuted her. It was so frightening the way my body would shake when they shocked me, they put rags in my throat so I could not scream, she said. But I screamed so loud, loud sometimes I sounded like an animal. I would even scare myself. In 1983, a CIA agent known as Mr. Mike visited her in a secret jail where she was being tortured by Battalion 316. And Mr. Chairman, in the interest of getting to our witnesses, I'm going to uh, submit the rest of my testimony uh, uh, here for the record. But I, I do want it said that for too long the U.S. government has hidden its involvement with the military and paramilitary groups in Central America. Investi information relating to human rights abuses should be the highest priority for classification. We cannot leave any stone unturned in exposing the hidden truths regarding human rights violations. I have uh, spent quite a bit of time studying this, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Um, there's a book which you may be familiar with, The Massacre at El Mazote, which talks about how uh, an entire village in El Salvador was wiped out with the help of a paramilitary group who had received aid from uh, the United States. 733 people were murdered, uh, a good many of them children and women. Our government's official policy at that time was such that there was complete denial, as there is a denial going on all the time about human rights abuses that we unfortunately have been complicit in. 
The American taxpayers should know how their tax dollars are used at times. And it's important to have a hearing like this. And I congratulate Mr. Lantos for bringing this issue forward, because we need to know how government policy affects other countries. And we also need to know how taxpayers' dollars are being used in support of, of torture and human rights abuses. I don't believe the American people condone this. I don't believe the American people condone this. I don't believe the American people think that the Department of Justice and the Department of State ought not to be held accountable and should not appear before us today to testify. Uh, with that, I want to uh, send this back to the Chair and thank the Chairman for the gentleman for his very helpful opening comments. I'd now like to yield to the author of the bill, H.R. 2635, the gentleman from California, Mr. Lantos. His life has been devoted to human rights. He is the co-chairman with John Porter of Illinois of a bipartisan human rights caucus. Uh, he has long been active in this area, and in the course of his remarks, it would be most helpful if you explain how your bill would get at this when it becomes law. Mr. Lantos. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I first would like to <clears throat> commend you for holding this hearing on what I consider to be one of the most important issues to come before the Congress uh, this, ses this session. Your own long commitment to the protection of human rights and your leadership on this issue in Congress is second to none. I also want to commend and congratulate my good friend, the distinguished ranking member of this committee, Congressman Dennis Kucinich of Ohio, who although only in his first term has already established himself as an outstanding legislator and the champion of human rights. His co-sponsorship and strong support of the Human Rights Information Act is just another expression of his sincere commitment to this all-encompassing issue. Dennis has been an outstanding advocate for the families and friends of the three American nuns and the lay worker tragically murdered in El Salvador in 1980, an issue on which he has provided exemplary leadership. Mr. Chairman, I would like to put both the issue, my legislation, and this hearing in some kind of a historical perspective. Because I think it's important as we discuss an issue on which I believe there is great bipartisan unity in this body, um, and we are opposed to the administration, that Secretary of State Madeleine Albright's recent observation that the United States is the indispensable nation on the face of this planet, in my humble judgment, is a very accurate and apt description. Had it not been for Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who turned around an isolationist nation, and had we not assumed in the early 40s our international responsibility as the indispensable nation, history would have been different. We could be looking at a European continent dominated by Nazi Germany, and an Asia run by Imperial Japan. And through Republican and Democratic presidents, beginning with Franklin Roosevelt, the United States, with occasional lapses, has been the indispensable nation. Without the United States, the world would be in infinitely worse shape. I find it necessary to state this obvious because in this particular instance, our government policy, I am convinced, is dead wrong. But I don't want either my very harsh comments concerning this policy and 
the general issue of um, my legislation cloud the underlying reality that the United States is the indispensable nation for trying to create a more civilized world. And I am profoundly convinced that my legislation is very much in line with that broad objective. I think it is particularly appropriate that we are meeting on this legislation on the 50th anniversary of the Berlin Airlift, which was yet another example of how the United States, with courage and determination, changed the course of history. What we are asking in this modest piece of legislation is merely to correct one of several mistakes our government has made over the last 60 years. I was pleasantly surprised, Mr. Chairman, that on Sunday, the New York Times devoted a major editorial uh, to my legislation and this issue. And I'd like to quote from this editorial, which I think so appropriately summarizes what we are after. The title of the editorial is A Timely Key for Unlocking History. Despite the Clinton administration's promise to open Cold War archives, Central American and Caribbean countries investigating recent abuses have found it difficult to get information they need. American intelligence and diplomatic officials serving in Honduras, Haiti, El Salvador, and Guatemala collected information about human rights and many had relationships with the abusers. But when investigators in trials or truth commissions have sought the documents, declassification has often been incomplete and tardy. An effort to change this, the subject of a congressional hearing on Monday, deserves the administration's full support. And I want to repeat this. I think this legislation does deserve the administration's full support, as it enjoys the full support of distinguished Republicans and Democrats in this body. The Human Rights Information Act would give agencies 120 days to make declassification decisions on requests from truth commissions and other official investigative panels. Currently, the process can take years. Honduras has been waiting since 1993 for documents from the CIA. The bill covers only Central American and Caribbean nations, but can and should be broadened. It would also require the agencies to lean toward openness, applying standards that have been used successfully in the recent release of documents on the Kennedy assassination without revealing intelligence sources or methods. They require a precise definition of harm to national security before material can be withheld. This should combat the widespread practice of keeping material classified merely because it embarrasses the American government. Administration officials say the bill will let Congress dictate matters that should be the prerogative of the President. But my measure gives the President the final say. They also argue that this administration has done more than any previous one to declassify documents and reveal American abuses. That is true. But since it is unencumbered by Cold War abuses, and the old enemy is gone, it should be doing more. Countries find it difficult enough to uncover the past, bring abusers to account, and create respect for the law without having to wrestle with Washington along the way. That is the editorial from the New York Times. Uh, without objection, we'll put it in the record at this point. I appreciate that, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I also would like to uh, say a word about the tragic murder of the bishop in Guatemala and the break-in into the home 
of Carlos Federico Reyes Lopez of the Office of Human Rights of the Archbishop of Guatemala. Just a few days ago, his uh, materials and computer containing information this hearing were taken, uh, indicating the anxiety that perpetrators of outrages feel even today about information being made public. I strongly urge, Mr. Chairman, that this legislation be adopted. I, I think the administration would do well in its own self-interest not to fight what we are asking for. This administration is not responsible for the crimes committed many years ago. It should not now be in a position of attempting to participate in the cover-up. And before I close, Mr. Chairman, I want to express my personal appreciation to the Director of the Human Rights Caucus uh, on my staff, uh, Hans Hofgerber, who has done such a superb job in preparing this hearing. I ask that my prepared statement be uh, included in the record, and I yield back the balance of my time. We thank you very much for that eloquent statement. Just as a matter of practice before this subcommittee, the minute you're introduced, the full statement is put in the record, and that will be the same with the witnesses. We don't want you to read the whole statement. It's there in the record. What we'd like you to do for questions and a dialogue. And uh, we don't rush witnesses. We just want the whole story to get out on the table. Now, with that, we're going to begin with the first panel. And I might say, under the rules of the Government Reform and Oversight Committee and this subcommittee, all witnesses are sworn in uh, before they testify. And we have three panels uh, this morning. We'll try to complete this hearing in three-hour period. The first panel is Dr. Gil Vidaris Lanza, the National Commissioner of the Protection of Human Rights in Honduras. He will be accompanied by Susan Peacock, uh, his interpreter. So on the panel is Carlos Federico Reyes Lopez, Office of Human Rights, Bishop of Guatemala, and Jennifer Harberry, a citizen. And I think uh, many of Ms. Harberry's very eloquent made on 60 Minutes and other shows over the last few years about her husband, what has happened to him. Uh, so if the three witnesses and the interpreter come forward, we'll swear in and begin. Ms. Peacock, the interpreter, is right there. Dr. Lanza is next. Mr. Lopez and Ms. Harbury. <laughs> Is your right hand, Ms. Harbury, Mr. Lopez? Do you swear that the testimony you're about to give this subcommittee will be the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth? Yes, I am. The uh, clerk will note that all four witnesses, we include the interpreter, uh, will have sworn in and taken the oath. And we will now begin with Dr. Lanza, uh, via Darlis uh, Lanza, and uh, you said it at your own pace because uh, maybe paragraph by paragraph, uh, Ms. Peacock can translate. Please proceed. <clears throat> Distinguido Señor Horn y miembros del subcomité. Distinguished Mr. Horn and members of the subcommittee. Gracias por la invitación para estar presente el día de hoy. Thank you for the invitation to be present here today. Y brindar mi apoyo a la Ley de Información de Derechos Humanos. To support the Human Rights Information Act. Como la autoridad principal de los derechos humanos as en Honduras. As Honduras' chief human rights official. Desde hace mucho tiempo he hecho esfuerzos para obtener del gobierno de los Estados Unidos I have long sought to obtain from the United States government 
información sobre abusos de la década pasada. Information about abuses from the past decade. Expreso mi agradecimiento a los miembros del Congreso por el apoyo que me han brindado. I express my gratitude to members of Congress for their support. El cual ha sido críticamente importante a lo largo de mis esfuerzos de desclasificación. Which has been critically important to my declassification efforts. Soy el Comisionado Nacional de los Derechos Humanos. En Honduras. I am the National Commissioner for Human Rights in Honduras. Me desempeño como comisionado. I serve as commissioner. También conocido como ombudsman. Also referred to as ombudsman. Desde 1992. Since 1992. Como comisionado me corresponde investigar los abusos en materia de derechos humanos cometidos por las autoridades hondureñas. As commissioner, I am to investigate human rights abuses committed by Honduran authorities, incluyendo a los militares y a la policía. Including the military and the police. Me desempeño como abogado y portavoz de los ciudadanos hondureños que han formulado sus denuncias. I serve as advocate and spokesman for Honduran citizens who have filed complaints. La ley hondureña establece el carácter independiente de nuestras investigaciones. Honduran law establishes the independent nature of our investigations. Y la obligatoriedad de suministrarnos información. And the ob obligation to provide us information tanto de las autoridades como de las entidades gubernamentales. Both from government officials and entities. El comisionado no tiene la potestad para enjuiciar los casos que evidencian asuntos delictivos. The commissioner does not have the power to prosecute cases where there is evidence of criminal wrongdoing. Pero sí está obligado a trasladar la información al Fiscal General de la República. But yes, he is obligated to pass information on to the Attorney General of the Republic. Quien acusa formalmente a los supuestos responsables. Who formally charges those who are allegedly responsible. Durante mis primeros meses como comisionado. During my first months as commissioner. Me reuní personalmente con las familias que habían perdido algún ser querido durante la década de los 80. I personally met with the families that had lost loved ones during the decade of the 80s. Y escuché sus emotivas peticiones. And I listened to their emotional petitions. Sus testimonios me conmovieron profundamente. Their testimonies touched me deeply. Entonces decidí investigar. So I decided to investigate. En el mes de diciembre de 1993, in the month of December in 1993, presenté mis hallazgos en un informe preliminar que se titula, I presented my findings in a preliminary report entitled, Los hechos hablan por sí mismos. The facts speak for themselves. Dicho informe documenta 184 casos de desapariciones. This report documents 184 cases of disappearances. Indicando quiénes eran supuestamente los responsables en cada caso. Indicating who was allegedly responsible in each case. La información fue remitida al Fiscal General de la República. The information was given to the Attorney General of the Republic para que formulara las acusaciones. So that he could bring charges. Como resultado, As a result, más de una docena de militares y policías han sido formalmente acusados. More than a dozen military and police have been formally charged. Al inicio de mis investigaciones sobre las desapariciones, at the beginning of my investigation of disappearances, Remití por primera vez al gobierno de los Estados Unidos mi solicitud de desclasificación. I first submitted my declassification request to the U.S. government. La 
la administración del presidente Clinton expresó su voluntad de cooperar. The administration of President Clinton expressed a willingness to cooperate. Pero declaró que mi petición era demasiado amplia. But said that my request was too broad. Dos veces revisé mi solicitud. Twice I revised my request. El primero de agosto de 1995. On August 1st, 1995. Personalmente entregué una versión abreviada al embajador de los Estados Unidos. I personally handed an abridged version to the U.S. ambassador. Yo quiero explicar por qué la información de los Estados Unidos es de extrema importancia para las investigaciones de derechos humanos en Honduras. I want to explain why U.S. information is of extremely great importance to human rights investigations in Honduras. En Honduras no existe legislación que permita salvaguardar los archivos del Estado. Honduras has no legislation that allows for the preservation of state archives. Honduras tampoco cuenta con un proceso legal que permita hacer públicos documentos gubernamentales. Neither does Honduras have a legal process that permits the public disclosure of government documents. Archivos claves en Honduras han sido destruidos. Key Honduran files have been destroyed. Un ejemplo de ello es la inspección realizada por investigadores de derechos humanos en las oficinas de inteligencia militar hondureña. One example of this is an inspection done by human rights investigators of the offices of Honduran military intelligence. Únicamente encontraron los archivos vacíos. They found only empty file cabinets. Se les informó que los archivos militares son quemados cada cinco años. They were told that military files are burned every five years. Por razones de espacio. For reasons of space. Consecuentemente, Consequently, nuestros esfuerzos para recuperar documentos hondureños relevantes sobre las violaciones a los derechos humanos acaecidos en el pasado han sido infructuosos. Our efforts to recover Honduran documents related to past human rights violations have not been fruitful. Es un hecho reconocido que los Estados Unidos cuentan con el más sofisticado sistema de información en el mundo. It is known and recognized that the United States has the most sophisticated information system in the world. Admiro la forma en que el público tiene acceso a los muchos archivos gubernamentales. I admire the way that the public has access to many government files. Creo que los, eh, los registros meticulosos ofrecen a Honduras la mejor oportunidad para conocer la documentación histórica en materia de violaciones a los derechos humanos. I believe that the meticulous records offer Hondurans the best opportunity to uncover historical documentation of human rights violations. Para conocer la verdad histórica, to establish the historical truth, necesitamos los documentos sobre la estrecha colaboración del gobierno de los Estados Unidos con las Fuerzas Armadas de Honduras en los años 80. We need documents about the close collaboration between the U.S. government and the Honduran armed forces in the 1980s. No espero que la información que me suministren los archivos del gobierno de Estados Unidos van a evidenciar la identidad de los violadores. I do not expect that information from U.S. files will definitively divulge the identity of violators. Sin embargo, nonetheless, yo tengo la esperanza que la información nos pueda suministrar importantes pistas. I have the hope that the information will provide important clues. La información de los Estados Unidos complementa la que hemos recogido en Honduras mediante las Exhumaciones. U.S. information complements that gathered in Honduras from exhumations y entrevistas con testigos and interviews with eyewitnesses sobre, 
sobrevivientes de detenciones clandestinas y tortura survivors of clandestine detention and torture y exmilitares hondureños and former Honduran military mis esfuerzos para obtener información por parte del gobierno de los Estados Unidos están debidamente documentados. My efforts to obtain human rights information from the U.S. government are well documented. <coughs> en el mes de, de enero del año en curso, in the month of January this year, publiqué un informe interino sobre la desclasificación que lleva por título I published an interim report on declassification that is entitled En búsqueda de la verdad que se nos oculta In search of hidden truths Dicho informe describe el proceso que a la fecha This report describes the process to date Y analiza una parte de la información que nosotros hemos recibido and analyzes part of the information that we have received. Yo debo decirles que algunos documentos ya han sido desclasificados. I should tell you that some documents have already been declassified. El Departamento de Estado y el Pentágono completaron la búsqueda en sus archivos. The State Department and the Pentagon have completed the search of their files. Y entregaron aproximadamente 2,500 y 150 páginas. And they released approximately 2,500 and 150 pages, respectively. La CIA entregó 36 documentos relacionados con el caso del ciudadano estadounidense padre James Carney. The CIA turned over 36 documents on the disappearance of U.S. citizen father James Carney. 94 documentos sobre cinco casos hondureños. 94 documents on five Honduran cases. 21 documentos sobre el general Álvarez Martínez. 21 documents on general Álvarez Martínez. Y 812 páginas de material ya previamente desclasificado. And 812 pages of previously declassified material. Yo aprecio la voluntad de la administración del presidente Clinton de responder a mi solicitud de desclasificación. I appreciate the willingness of the administration of President Clinton to respond to my declassification request. Pero tengo que decir con toda honestidad. But I must say, in all honesty, que el proceso para obtener documentos de los Estados Unidos es frustrante. That the process to obtain U.S. documents is frustrating. Aunque se me ha dicho repetidamente que mi petición está ejecutándose expeditamente. Although they, although they have told me repeatedly that my request is being expedited, la respuesta es demasiado lenta. The response is too slow. Hay que recordar que en materia de derechos humanos el tiempo es oro. You have to remember that in human rights, time is gold. Y el reloj está caminando. And the clock is ticking. Para citar un ejemplo, to give an example, la CIA todavía no ha entregado registros sobre la conocida unidad de inteligencia militar. The CIA has yet to release records on the well-known military intelligence unit. El batallón 316. Battalion 316. Tampoco ha desclasificado el informe de su inspector general. Neither has it declassified its Inspector General's report. Elaborado el año pasado. Completed last year. En relación con el ejército hondureño. In relation to the Honduran army. A pesar de las, explica de las inexplicables tardanzas. Despite inexplicable delays. Mantenemos la esperanza de que estos documentos nos van a ser entregados en un futuro cercano. We maintain the hope that these documents will be released to us in the near future. Del contenido sustancial de derechos humanos. As far as substantive human rights content is concerned. Hemos de decir que la información que se nos ha suministrado es escasa e inadecuada. We have to say that the information that has been given us is scant and inadequate. De hecho. In fact, el contenido de muchos de los documentos 
entregados es periférico con relación a lo especificado en mi solicitud. The content of many of the documents released is peripheral with relation to the specifics in my requests. Un número de documentos a number of documents <coughs> particularmente aquellos que provienen del Departamento de Defensa y de la CIA particularly those from the Defense Department and the CIA están fuertemente tachados are heavily redacted. Permítanme ponerles un ejemplo. Allow me to give you an example. Yo solicité información sobre un hombre el, I, I requested information about a man el cual fue una figura central de las Fuerzas Armadas de Honduras. Who was the central figure in the Honduran Armed Forces. En el momento en que ocurrieron terribles abusos a los derechos humanos en mi país. At the time when terrible human rights abuses occurred in my country. Su nombre, General Gustavo Álvarez Martínez. His name, General Gustavo Adolfo Álvarez Martínez. Que está acusado de haber ordenado la ejecución extrajudicial de numerosos ciudadanos. He is accused of having ordered the extrajudicial execution of numerous citizens. Mi petición respecto a Álvarez es muy específica. My, res my request with respect to Álvarez is very specific. En parte dice. In part it reads. Todos los informes que nombran a Álvarez en referencia al uso de secuestro, desapariciones y tortura en contra de grupos o individuos subversivos. All records which mention Álvarez in reference to the use of kidnapping, disappearance and torture against subversive groups or individuals. Y en referencia a violaciones de derechos humanos and in reference to violations of human rights, operaciones extrajudiciales, extra legal operations, actividades de escuadrones de la muerte, activities of death squads, y el mantenimiento de cárceles clandestinas, and the maintenance of clandestine jails. La CIA solo entregó 21 documentos sobre Álvarez. The CIA released only 21 documents on Álvarez. La mayor parte de estos documentos hablan acerca de atentados por grupos subversivos para asesinar a Álvarez. Most of these documents talk about attempts by subversive groups to assassinate Álvarez. En vez de referirse a las acciones de Álvarez dirigidas en contra de los grupos o individuos subversivos. Instead of referring to actions of Álvarez directed against subversive groups or individuals. Los documentos del Departamento de Defensa Documents of the Department of Defense tampoco responden a parte de mi petición. Also do not respond to this portion of my request. En resumen, In summary, los resultados de la desclasificación son decepcionantes. The results of the declassification are disappointing. Mucho tiempo valioso ha transcurrido desde la presentación de mi petición. Much valuable time has elapsed since the presentation of my request. Y lastimosamente la cantidad y contenido de la información obtenida es insatisfactoria. And unfortunately, both the quantity and the content of the information obtained is unsatisfactory. Después de haber dicho esto, Having said that, yo quiero reiterar mi compromiso de trabajar de buena fe en el proceso de desclasificación. I want to reiterate my commitment to work in good faith through the declassification process. Y continúo con la esperanza de que la información nos será proporcionada. And I continue with the hope that the information will be forthcoming. Y que esta será útil en nuestras investigaciones. And that it will be useful in our investigations. Proporcionando información sustancial en materia de derechos humanos. Providing substantive human rights information. Los Estados Unidos pueden ayudar en la lucha en Honduras para terminar con la impunidad. 
the United States can help in the struggle in Honduras to end impunity. Y construir una sociedad democrática más abierta. And to build a more open democratic society. Honduras necesita la información de los Estados Unidos. Honduras needs U.S. information. Porque ella ayudará a determinar si nuestras autoridades fueron responsables en las violaciones de derechos humanos. Because it will help determine whether our authorities were responsible for human rights violations. El ciclo de impunidad debe romperse. The cycle of impunity must be broken. En aquellas situaciones en las que las autoridades hondureñas hayan estado involucradas, In those situations where Honduran authorities have been involved, habrá que enjuiciarlas por los crímenes cometidos. They must be prosecuted for the crimes committed. Si el Estado de Derecho se ha establecido en Honduras, If the rule of law is to be established in Honduras, las autoridades tienen que ser responsables de sus acciones. Authorities must be held responsible for their actions. Existe una palabra en inglés que no tiene traducción en el español. There is a word in English that has no translation in Spanish. Que a mí me gusta mucho. That I like a lot. Es accountability. It's accountability. Sin accountability. Without accountability. La democracia no puede ser consolidada. Demo democracy cannot be consolidated. El pueblo hondureño tiene el derecho de conocer la verdad acerca de las violaciones a los derechos humanos ocurridas en su propio territorio. The Honduran people have the right to know the truth about human rights violations that occurred on their own territory. Brindando su apoyo a la Ley de Información de Derechos Humanos. By giving support to the Human Rights Information Act. El Congreso podría contribuir al fortalecimiento de la democracia hondureña. The Congress will contribute to the strengthening of Honduras's democracy. Nuevamente les agradezco la oportunidad de compartir con ustedes mis puntos de vista sobre este importante tema. Again, I appreciate the opportunity to share my views on this important matter. Yo aprecio todos sus esfuerzos a favor de mi país. I appreciate all your efforts on behalf of my country. Con la ayuda de ustedes, With your help, nosotros pod podremos quitar el velo de impunidad que cubre la verdad. We will remove the veil of impunity that covers the truth. Recordemos siempre lo que dice el Evangelio. Always remembering what is said in the gospel. Solo la verdad os hará libres. Only the truth will make you free. We thank you very much for that uh, most helpful statement. We will be getting into questions later, but we're now going to go to Mr. Reyes, and uh, I believe you, you will tell us first what happened to your statement. Thanks. Good morning. Um, first, I want to apologize for not give the writing testimonies, uh, because my copies and my computer was stolen in my home four days ago. Um, I don't want to think and imagine who did it. Well, this is not a presentation for the details uh, from the hour program in exhumations in the Archbishop and Human Rights Office, and his project recovered the historic memory. Only want to to give a little brief about the Archbishop Human Rights Office. Uh, he was founded in 98 by Catholic Church and Monsignor Her Herardi and Monsignor Prospero Penado del Barrio uh, was both the coordinators in the office and principal collaborators uh, with our programs and mental health and transformation of conflicts and legal action. And since 95, uh, the project, the recuperation of the memories, a historical memory, until 24, April 24, 98, uh, the presentation day. Two days after Monsignor Her Herardi, he was killed in his garage by cement block with, uh, hit, uh, with 17 hits in the head 
and destroy all the bones from the face, uh, frontal and the and the other head and the other parts. Pardon. I want to divide uh, this this testimony in two parts. First, uh, I want to give a little brief and details in our program and the limits and the death threats and the intimidations in our job and how the desclassified documents we can help in our program and the progress and the after and before the sign of peace. And then uh, another, another little brief about the, this publication, uh, Guatemala, Guatemala Never Again. This is four volumes in all the history and I think this is uh, complementary to the work and the commission on the historical clarification. We begin um, our job in 96 and try to reach all the, all the elements to give and all the testimonies give to the Remy. This is the, this is the name of the project and, and try to exhume, identify, uh, try to reach all the elements, um, clarify all the past, all the, all the present and try to not repeat to the future. I have a four photographs and I want to see uh, how is the, the job, how is the, all the elements, how is the um, shape of the, uh, I don't know, the, the skeletons, the, uh, all the identification, the clothes uh, and the photographs from the woman uh, with, a, with a fetus from the seven months inside her body. First, um, I want to thanks all the all the invitation, especially with the um, all the testimonies. We can help uh, try to clarify the past and the present. If you can see another photograph, it, this is this is one of the step of this process, and you can recognize a woman, a naked naked woman. She was raped. And you can see in the, in the middle of the photograph, uh, this is a little white, white part. This belongs to the, to the fetus on seven, on seven months. Yeah. And the another photograph, maybe we can, we can show how is the evidence in the we try to recover in the, in the field and try to compare with the testimonies from the people first and from the desclassified uh, documents second and third, try to identify the people and give a uh, Christian, Christian burial. This is another example from the mass grave in on the north of the of the capital from 94 bodies recovered in the mass grave and total the 140 40, a 40 skeletons this is uh, one of the example uh, maybe 74 or 75 denounces presented to the project to the remy and try to reach and try to exhume and try to collaborate with the public minister, with the judges, with the police, with the army. Well, some people in the army try to, help, to give information about all, this, all these crimes. At the end, in this part, I want to show how is the forensic evidence try to help to the people and try to uh, try to compare with the information in these classified documents? Uh, I don't know. It's some like uh, examples, techniques uh, um, give to the people from the army and use and try to kill people. Try 
try to threat, try to intimidate all the, in all the country. You can see in the back on the, in, on, on the photograph the machete wounds and try to give an example in this community uh, not collaborate with the guerrilla. This is the, the knowledge. And then I want to give a little brief about the, this publication, Guatemala Nunca Más. All the elements contained in this, in this book, especially the volume two, contains uh, information that is classified documents, especially with the victims and techniques and the terror and the technology, um, the a statement from the army, the police, the death squads, the human rights uh, violations since um, psychiatric violations, sexual violations, and all, all the elements that try to clarify the past and try to, to, to see and and the use with the commission, the, the clarification of the past. I want to, I want to give a little, a little words about the, the Gerardi. Uh, I think he was, and he is for me, one of the, one of the people, and try to make a pressure with the public minister, with the Congress of the United States. Uh, with the police, with the civil, civil patrols, all the people who are involved in this kind of facts. And he, for me, he was and he is alive. And want to say in his words, Monsignor Gerardi, Guatemala nunca más, Guatemala never again. And I want to give this uh, these copies from you, and this is one of proof. This is one of the first of all, uh, principal reasons I think he was killed, because uh, this is the truth, and Guatemala is not custom to say the truth. And I don't want to. I don't want more deaths. I don't want to die, because uh, my family and many people who works uh, for me on near from me is very death threats with, uh, by death squads, by policemen, by people from army. And I think this is, this is one of the biggest efforts for me and for Guatemala, but try to clarify all the past. Thanks. Well, we thank you for uh, your testimony and uh, we'll review those books with uh, great care. Are you going to test my four years of Spanish, or is there also an English edition there? <laughs> we'll, we'll get our Spanish friends. My district director is, uh, speaks Spanish fluently. She was born in Chihuahua, Mexico, so we'll put her to work on that. <laughs> we thank you for that testimony. And now, uh, Ms. Harbury. Jennifer Harbury is well known to many in this country, and uh, she's been a very brave American citizen to uh, go and... Uh, uh, face up to a military government and face up to torture and brutality and uh, it's a pleasure to have you here today and we're sorry it's under such circumstances. Well I certainly want to thank the committee for for inviting me to speak today. I certainly want to thank you especially Mr. Horn and, and certainly Mr. Lantos and Porter especially also for their special work on this bill and I'd like to thank both Mr. Valladares and my friend Frederico also for the really remarkable work they've been doing in Central America at great risk to themselves for so many years. <clears throat> I'd like to just summarize my story. I think most of us know a, a number of the parts of my story, so I'll, I'll make it as brief as possible. There are three issues that I think are raised and, and established by my own case that are very typical um, of the situation we're dealing with in Central America, especially in Guatemala and in Honduras. Number one, although the facts of my case are very shocking in their brutality, it's simply a typical case. And for that reason, I think it's a very good illustration <coughs> <excuse> me, <coughs> of the humanitarian reasons we need to open these files, not only for the sake of people who were abducted and tortured, 
uh, but for those of us who remain behind and don't know what happened to our family members. I think it's also very important um, to understand the facts of the case because it's one of the few cases where we can see that the U.S. government does have the information. They so often say there's nothing for us to declassify, but that is not true. There is a great deal. The third reason is I think it becomes clear step by step in following my case that there has been misconduct, frequent misconduct, perhaps a pattern of practice of misconduct in refusing to timely and appropriately release information which is not a matter of national security. Um, again, I think most of you are fairly familiar with what became of my husband. His name was Efrain Bamake Velazquez. He was a Mayan resistance leader in Guatemala for a number of years. He was captured alive on March the 12th, 1992 by the Guatemalan army. I now know that he was kept in a clandestine prison, several different clandestine prisons for more than a year, perhaps two years. He was tortured throughout that period of time. He was repeatedly drugged by army physicians. He was kept in a full body cast to prevent his escape and was eventually assassinated without trial. Uh, the kinder and gentler version of the three versions I have of his death is that he was thrown from a helicopter into the ocean. Another is that he was dismembered and scattered across a sugar cane field so that I would never find him and be able to identify him. What happened? I'd like to divide my summary into two parts also. The first just to say what happened, how did I find out what happened, who said what and when, and then briefly discuss some of the major documents I found out and received through my Freedom of Information Act litigation over a period of years. I think the most tragic issue in this case and one that I feel is most appropriately brought before this committee is that my husband's death could have been prevented if information had been timely and appropriately released not only to myself but to yourselves as members of the United States Congress. That's not only true of my husband's case but of a number of, of prisoners of war also being held and tortured. Again, um, when I first learned that my husband disappeared, I was informed by the Guatemalan army that they had uh, found his body after the combat, that he'd been killed in a skirmish. They'd found his cadaver and buried him in the nearby town of Retaluleo. For nearly a year, it was my understanding that he was dead, that he'd died in combat. Uh, given that situation, I did not come forward to any human rights groups because there is an ongoing, was an ongoing civil war in Guatemala. However, in the early 1993, a young prisoner of war was ap actually able to escape from a military base alive and tell me that a hoax was being carried out by the army. They had, in fact, captured my husband alive and were subjecting him to long-term interrogation through torture uh, in order to break him psychologically so that he would start releasing all of his information. He was a very high-ranking commander who had been in the mountains for 17 years and for military intelligence purposes was the goose that laid the golden egg. They did not wish to kill him, they wished to break him. The last time this witness saw my husband alive was July of 1992. He was strapped to a cot, hands and feet, stripped nearly naked. There was an unidentified gas tank next to the bed. His body was grotesquely swollen, two to three times normal size. An arm and leg were heavily bandaged as if they had hemorrhaged and he was raving. The man bending over the torture table was Colonel Julio Roberto Alperez, a School of the Americas graduate and a paid CIA informant, as we later learned. Um, they had actually called physicians to stand by to make sure they did not accidentally throw him into shock and kill him. They wanted to keep him alive. At that point, of course, I returned to Guatemala, opened the grave, and found the body of a completely different person. Fifteen years too young, five centimeters too short, different dental patterns. They're forensically impossible to be him. Um, at that point, of course, I went repeatedly to the State Department, to the United States Embassy, to all members of Congress, to every, United, to every human rights group on the face of the planet, and began to receive a great deal of support from everyone except the State Department and the Embassy. They told me repeatedly they would look into it right away, they didn't know what had happened to him, they'd get back to me when they could. And for the next two years, starting with Mar March 1993, when I first went to them, they sent out this form letter to everyone including almost everybody in the United States Congress who was making inquiry on my behalf. And it said repeatedly, we have no independent information confirming the existence of any clandestine Guatemalan military prisons. We have no independent information regarding the whereabouts of Mr. Bamaka. Uh, if we might, I'd like that those letters in the record at this point without objection. I've uh, left an entire copy of all of these documents with your officer, and, and I can Fine. leave all of these uh, Just also as if you, you wish. Just as you mention them, we'll put them at that part. Okay. 
given the situation and given that I used to go to the morgues to help uh, people identify the dead in Guatemala during my time as a human rights observer, I knew that time was of the essence and that my husband would be suffering horribly from the tortures he was undergoing. I therefore, getting no help from the United States Embassy, started a series of hunger strikes. The first was September 1993, right after I opened the grave and was in front of military intelligence installations in the middle of Guatemala City. That lasted seven days. The second one was at the end of 1994, because I realized time was up. If he was alive, he would not be alive for much longer because the peace talks were coming to an end. So I went on a hunger strike to the death. I didn't want to survive without him if there was any way of keeping him alive. Uh, the embassy sent someone to see me on a daily basis and continued to inform everyone in the United States Congress and everyone else that they had no such information. One of those letters is dated October 25th. That's about day 25 into my hunger strike. Um, on day 30, as my hair was falling out and I was developing a heart murmur and I could not open my left eye around then, that's when 60 Minutes came out and Mike Wallace said, we're not sure why they won't tell her the truth. The embassy has a CIA report why saying he was captured staff, alive. Why uh, don't put that up uh, there and uh, then you can get back to the microphone so we can hear you. Thank you. Around that time, Mike Wallace came out on 60 Minutes saying, we don't know why the embassy will not tell you the truth. They have a CIA bulletin saying he was captured alive. Day 32 of my hunger strike, by the way, the Irish, prisoner, the Irish prisoners died around day 25 on their hunger strike in Ireland. By day 32, the U.S. ambassador called me sheepishly into the embassy and said, yes, we do have intelligence information showing he was captured alive in 1992. It was now almost 1995. He was lightly but not seriously wounded. His wounds were li not life-threatening. We have no information he's still alive. I, of course, being an attorney, said, what does that mean? Do you have any information he's dead? And was told repeatedly, no, they didn't know what had happened to him and would assume he was alive for purposes of the investigation. Given the fallout politically from this announcement, I went back to Washington thinking I would be assisted. I filed my Freedom of Information Act request, asked the National Security Council to give me all documents on the situation because time was of the essence and his life was at stake. I got zero. It was a life and death situation. I was promised expedited processing under the act. I was given nothing. I told them, March, March the 12th, third anniversary of his capture, I'm back on the hunger strike, this time in front of the White House. Please, I won't live through it a third time. He's definitely not going to live through it. And I would be pressured to assume he was dead because after all, it's been three years, terrible things happen in Guatemala, he must be dead, but we don't know what happened to him and we'll assume he's alive. So of course, I went back on my hunger strike and it was then that Senator Torricelli had the great courage and decency to come forward and tell me, no, he is dead. The State Department knows this. He was ordered killed upon orders of Colonel Julio Roberto Alperez years ago. At that point, I filed suit. And this is where the documents come in that I summarized in my report. They include a document that showed that six days after my husband was captured in 1992, the CIA informed both the State Department and the White House in writing that Commander Everardo has just been captured alive uh, and the Army will probably fake his death to better take advantage of his intelligence. When I first went to the State Department in 1993, this was not released to me nor to anyone in the United States Congress. They said at first, well, that's because we didn't have both of his names and we didn't, you know, feed it into our computer right. But here's the March notes from 1993 of my first meeting with them. Both names are present, spelled correctly. More disturbing, two months later in May of 1993, they'd got a report saying that several, uh, three military officials in Guatemala had been interviewed, that one of them said Everardo was still alive, and that there were about 350 or more prisoners being held by the army. They continued to send out for the next year and a half a letter saying there was no independent evidence about any prisoners or my husband. Then in September, as I sat on my first hunger strike in front of a row of cannons, this report comes out saying, there's, of course there's clandestine prisoners in Guatemala. The Army has always held them that way. They're routinely interrogated and then killed. And Bamaka has been interrogated and killed. Of course he was captured alive. 
that was sent to the embassy. It was also sent to the State Department as I sat in front of the row of cannons. It was never reported to me. It was never reported to Congress. The form letter continued to go out. By Christmas, they got a report from an embassy contact that actually interviewed people who had helped to capture him. That was never given to me either. By the following spring, six months before my hunger strike, my long hunger strike that's reflected in that photograph, this do d document was, was uh, sent around to a number of different agencies, and it says, yes, at the Reto Luleo base, they used to keep prisoners in pits filled with water so deep they had to hang onto overhead bars to keep from drowning. One technique used to remove insurgents that had been killed during interrogation. Note the sanitized language. People don't drop dead from being asked their name and dog tag numbers. And at times that were still alive, had survived torture, but needed to disappear was to throw them out of aircraft over the ocean. Aravas were normally parked at the south end of the runway after midnight, manned only by a pilot and co-pilot. The pilots were instructed to fly 30 minutes off the coast of Guatemala, then push the prisoners and body out of the aircraft. In this way, they were able to remove the majority of evidence showing prisoners were tortured and killed. By November, towards the end of my hunger strike, there's a report that starts coming in about how he was kept in a full body cast and drugged repeatedly and notices that no one notes that no one has seen the other prisoners in a long time. Perhaps they've been killed. If the information had come out a year and a half earlier, some of those lives might have been saved. As they continue to talk to me saying they had no information, notes like this were coming through. You know, do we have any information he was thrown from a helicopter? Credible report that he was killed. Uh, we've told her we don't have any information. She seems to accept this, but then at the same time, this. Colonel Alpedo's had him killed a long time ago. Everyone in the Army knows it. My third hunger strike was unnecessary. So was my second. These deaths were not necessary. Again, I will close here just with the ending comments that I'm very concerned about the safety of all of my friends in Guatemala. Monsignor Gerardi was the most remarkable man. He has been killed because he told the truth. Human rights violations have continued in Guatemala for a year and a half after the signing of the peace accords because the killers in the army are still there. They have not been named. They are not in fear of being named. There have never been any consequences for even one of the 440 massacres in Guatemala, 440 El Mozote equivalents, or the 200,000 murders. If there are no consequences, not even a naming possible in the future, the killing will continue, of course. Next may be one of these people, next may be a judge, next may be a street child, next may be me. I continue for many years now to be under death threats myself. Um, so I'm just asking you, please help us with this. Thank you very much. Thank you for that uh, very moving statement. Let me put one question to all of you. Have you had an opportunity to read the legislation and what we were seeking to accomplish here? Any of you had the opportunity to look at Mr. Lantus's bill? Okay, Ms. Harberry, how will that legislation, if passed the Congress, signed by the President, how will that be helpful? In a number of different ways. If the basic underlying facts of these human rights cases are released, as some have been in my case, although of course not all, if some of those are released, there will be a number of different benefits. Number one, those who have perpetrated mass torture, murder, and terror in Guatemala will realize that they will no longer be shielded by the United States government. That in itself will act greatly to safeguard the lives of many of us. It will also give the court officials in Guatemala and Honduras the information they need to regain civilian de facto control of their countries. There may be civilian administrations, but there is not civilian control, as we just found out with Monsignor Gerardi. It will help bring peace and stability in a great measure to both countries. Second of all, it will help the family members of the disappeared, people like myself, only in much worse circumstances, to begin to heal. I still have an elderly friend who gets up every night at 3 in the morning to iron her missing son's shirts. He's been missing for 15 years. Another friend of mine is searching for her two daughters. They were six and seven when they disappeared in a house with their father, uncle, and grandfather. She could only find blood. There's a good chance they were sold into an adoption ring. And thirdly, I think it will help all of us United States citizens to regain faith in our own government. Mr. Uh, Reyes Lopez, uh, have you had a chance to read Mr. Lantus's bill? Um, 
Yes, uh, I think this is it's how, possible. How will it help you? That's what I want to make sure. And is there something we're missing that isn't in the bill that we should add in the bill? No, no, no. And I want, I want to say something about the, how, is, how is the petition to try to, to help this. And it's possible to, to take or to, or to have to desclassify documents. They try to identify techniques in, and I don't know, a process to try to clarify the past and try to identify uh, to the present and, for example, the, the assassination for Monsignor Gerardi, this is by death squads and, I don't know, uh, by night, uh, how many people, uh, how, how kind of weapons we can use, and uh, I, I don't know. This is, this is very, very helpful to try to stop in the future, maybe today, maybe tomorrow, and I think this is, this is very helpful. Uh, not, not only from human rights office, the archbishop, and uh, in all, in all the people from uh, from Guatemala. Thanks, uh, Mr. Valladares Ilanza. Is there uh, anything in the legislation that you find particularly helpful, or is there anything we're missing that should be in the legislation? Encuentro que es muy importante porque precisa. Plazos, específicamente. I find that it is very important because it specifies time frames. En el momento yo me encuentro como un peregrino que voy de una agencia a otra agencia. At this moment I'm like a pilgrim who goes from agency to agency. I, I, th I think you're right on the time frames. We still have documents from the First World War that are unclassified. I find that so unbelievable that it boggles the mind. But uh, they're still sitting in the executive branch and they have not been declassified. But y I think a time certain on some of these things would solve a lot of problems. Y, y creo que es muy importante que en esta época en que, que queremos comercio libre y hablamos de globalización, I think also that it's very important at this time when we're talking about free trade and globalization Globalicemos la democracia y el respeto a los derechos humanos That we also globalize democracy and respect for human rights Con esta ley ustedes están diciéndole a América eh, Central y al mundo en general With this law you are saying to Central America and the world in general Nosotros no estamos dispuestos a permitir violaciones a los derechos humanos en cualquier parte del mundo. We will not allow human rights violations anywhere in the world. Nosotros no tomaremos una actitud de silencio para ocultar la impunidad. We will not take an attitude of silence in order to hide impunity. Yo estoy tomando riesgo en venir aquí. I am taking a risk to come here. El viernes pasado, last Friday, llegó una persona, a person came, y eh, aduciendo que quería presentar un reclamo, and um, under the pretense of saying that they wanted to present a complaint, lo que quiso fue chantajearme. What they wanted to do was to blackmail me. Inventando una eh, mentira para dársela a la prensa. They had made up a lie that they intended to present to the press. Entonces para nosotros es muy importante. So for us it is very important. Porque también nos estamos jugando nuestra propia vida. Because our lives are at play. We thank you very much, and I now yield to the gentleman from Ohio for questioning. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the panel. I would like to uh, respond directly to uh, Senor Valladares. Quiero darle las gracias por testificar frente 
a nuestro comité. Quiero asegurarle de nuevo que tiene mi apoyo en la búsqueda de la verdad y la justicia por los derechos humanos. Además, quiero que le deje saber a su gente que estamos juntos en la búsqueda por la justicia. Gracias por su gran apoyo por los derechos humanos. Now to uh, get into some questions. I would like uh, Dr. Valladares uh, to explain his feelings on the usefulness of the Department of Defense document entitled Honduras Armed Forces, Human Rights and Corruption. Uh, staff will put up board number one. Uh, most of the uh, document has been redacted. Do you think that it's likely that the redacted information may be highly relevant to your work? Eh, para ser honesto, to be honest, prácticamente no me ayuda. Practically, this document doesn't help me. Eh, es más, quiero decirles What's more, I want to tell you que muchos sectores en mi país piensan que soy un iluso. That many people in my country feel that I'm uh, a, a misled man. Que nunca me van a dar información. That they're, they, they're never going to give me information. Pero yo soy astonishment. But I am a stubborn man. A stubborn man. Testarudo. Nosotros <laughs> <Very> juntos. <laughs> Y creo que um, en otras oportunidades And I think on other me han dado no solo documentos tachados, They have, just given me, uh, out sino que me han dado but, información copiada de la prensa. But they've also given me um, information that they've copied from the press. Y por ejemplo, aquí tengo otro documento And for example, I have another document here que se refiere that refers to a una información general sobre mi país. General information about my country. Sobre las principales ciudades. About major Honduran towns. No sé qué dirán de las principales ciudades. I don't know what they have to say about Honduran major towns. Pero también está tachado. But it's also blacked out. Entonces, yo a veces pienso. So I sometimes believe. Y perdónenme. And, and pardon me. Que yo creo que eh, los organismos de inteligencia clasifican absolutamente todo. But I believe that intelligence agencies classify absolutely everything. P probablemente para ocultar lo importante. Probably to hide that which is really important. I, I have a few uh, examples of some other documents you received from the Defense Department. And could you explain some of the problems with the information in the uh, just the documents displayed? If staff would put up uh, boards two and three uh, while you're doing that, the typographical errors were made on names. Uh, no, no identifying marks by officer date, no idea how long the document is. Uh, I guess uh, I would like to ask uh, Dr. Valladares, uh, can you use these documents for subsequent pro prosecutions? Has the Department of Defense offered to provide you with the original redacted documents? Uh, one of these documents simply discusses press reports. Do these documents provide much substantive information? Era lo que me refería anteriormente. This is what I referred to previously. Esos documentos no tienen más valor que el papel. These documents are not any more valuable than the paper they're written on. Y, y yo creo que entiendan que estamos buscando establecer la verdad y la justicia en un país. And I think you understand that we are trying to establish the truth and to establish justice in our country. Entonces, 
Esto lo que nos hace a todos es perder tiempo. So, what this does to us is it makes us lose time. Y quiero que entiendan que mi trabajo consiste en determinar si las autoridades cometieron o no abusos. And I believe that you understand that my work involves determining whether or not Honduran authorities were responsible for abuses. Y si vemos muchos de los documentos entregados, and if we look at many of the documents that have been released, se relacionan con cosas meramente circunstanciales. They talk about circumstantial uh, um, evidence. No la cuestión directa si ha participado o no una autoridad. Not the direct question of whether or not an authority was involved. Y también quiero que quede claro que esta información es complementaria a nuestras investigaciones. I also want it to be clear that this information complements the information from our own investigations. Porque las pruebas las tenemos que aportar nosotros directamente los hondureños. Because the evidence to be put forth, we have to put forth as Hondurans. Pero el hecho de que nosotros encontremos registros eh, aquí en los Estados Unidos, but the fact that we might find records here in the United States, obligaría a muchas autoridades hondureñas a reconocer acciones que ahora están negando. Would obligate Honduran authorities to recognize that abuses were committed. In, in line with that, uh, in your testimony, you state that the CIA has not yet released records on Battalion 316 or the 1997 CIA Inspector General report and its relationship with the Honduran military. Uh, can you tell us the significance of these documents to your work? Quiero contarles algo personal. I would like to tell you something personal. Cuando yo publiqué mi informe, los hechos hablan por sí mismos. When I published my report, the facts speak for themselves. Se produjo una conmoción en mi país. It produced commotion in my country. El presidente de la república en aquel entonces me mandó a llamar a su casa. The president of the country at that time called me to his home. Y yo dije, qué honor más grande tengo de ser invitado por el presidente a su propia casa. And I said to myself, what an honor to be invited by the president himself to his home. Pero era una encerrona, but una trampa. But it was a trap. Me sale muy enojado, vestido con su uniforme de fatiga. Um, a, a man who is very angry and dressed in his military fatigues. El general Luis Alonso Disco Elvir, comandante de las Fuerzas Armadas. General Luis Alonso Disco Elvir, the commander of the armed forces, was there. Y me empieza a increpar. And, and he begins to address me. Y le digo yo, yo no estoy bajo, bajo su obediencia. And I said to him, I, I don't have to be obedient Yo soy un to you. Libre. I am a free citizen. Entonces, él sacó un file and he held up a file. Y dijo, si yo hice el batallón 316, fue porque de la CIA me lo pidieron. He said, if I created the battalion 316, it was because I was asked to do so by the CIA. Y eso lo digo como un testimonio personal y porque sé que estoy bajo, bajo juramento. And I share this as a personal testimony knowing that I am under oath. Entonces, por eso son importantes para nosotros esos documentos. That's why these documents are important to us. Y por eso estoy en esta búsqueda. And that's why I'm involved in this search. Could, uh, thank you. Can you, uh, in following up on the reference to the CIA, uh, can you describe for this committee what access to information in the CIA files uh, would mean to the people of your country who have uh, suffered as a direct result of the human rights violations by Battalion 316 and other military, paramilitary, or security forces? And again, I want to state here for, the, for those who are, are just uh, watching now 
that this is about human rights violations. Decía que yo recibí testimonios muy emotivos. I said that I received very emotional testimony. Porque los familiares de las víctimas quieren saber qué ocurrió con ellos. Because the families of the victims want to know what happened with their loved ones. Quieren tener la satisfacción personal de conocer dónde están sus cuerpos. They want to have the personal satisfaction of knowing where the bodies are. Por otra parte, tenemos que entender que la ley solo se defiende con la ley. On the other hand, we also have to understand that laws are only defended legally. Que la democracia solo se defiende con democracia. Democracy is only defended dem uh, democratically. Para borrar ese pasado terrible. To erase this terrible past. Solo lo haremos mediante la verdad. We will only do it with the truth. Con la verdad podemos hacer justicia. With the truth we can do justice. Y con la justicia reconciliación. And with justice comes reconciliation. En nuestros países ahora tenemos democracia electoral. In our countries we now have electoral democracy. Pero necesitamos aplicar la ley. But we need to apply the law. Y el poder determinar quiénes fueron los responsables de estos abusos y llevarlos a juicio. And to be able to determine who was responsible for these abuses and to take those persons to trial. Nos daría seguridad en el sistema. That would give us security in our system. Es difícil tal vez para ustedes entender. It is perhaps difficult for you to understand que siendo yo una autoridad elegida unánimemente por el Congreso de mi país, that I, a person who was elected unanimously by the Congress of my country, no me puedan todavía garantizar ni mi propia seguridad las autoridades de mi país. The authorities of my country still cannot uh, guarantee my personal security. Y yo creo que tengo la obligación de seguir luchando. And I think that I have the obligation to continue to struggle. Porque esta es la única forma de construir una democracia. Because this is the only way to construct a democracy. Con la verdad with y the con truth la justicia. And with justice. Thank you very much. Uh, and I, I also want to say, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, thank you for calling this hearing. I think in this hearing, in the spirit of this hearing, we also pay tribute to the memory of Bishop Haradi uh, because uh, it was his courage that enabled the report to be brought forward. And I would like to think that uh, that courage still pervades the country of Guatemala as well as uh, is represented by the witnesses here today. Thank you. I thank the gentleman and I thank the panel, but before closing it, and you stole my punchline here, Dr. Leo Jose Valderas, I want to read a few of the things into the record. We'll put the whole resume in the record as we do with all of you. But I think before us we have not only a brave individual, we have a person that has been recognized for three or four decades for his knowledge of human rights. Uh, Dr. Leo Jose Valderas Ilanza started in 1966 as a professor of philosophy of law and constitutional law at the Autonomous University of Honduras. And just to look at a few of the things he's done, in the early 80s he was the legal advisor to the National Constituent Assembly. He's been uh, honored with the rank of ambassador and advisor to the Minister of Foreign Relations. He's been vice president of the Inter-American Commission for Human Rights and then president of that uh, fine group in 1990 and he's been honored in Europe, he's been honored in Latin America, he's been honored in the United States but I must say when he, he noted and I noted it a little before he said it 
that in March of 96, he was unanimously elected by the National Congress to serve as National Commissioner for Human Rights for a six-year term. And I was trying to think, has this Congress ever unanimously elected anybody that was at all controversial? But your Congress has done it, and I commend you uh, for having the support across the board. Uh, he also has uh, been the president right now of the Central American Council of Human Rights uh, Procurators. Uh, his doctorate was originally received in Spain, so he comes with great academic credentials in this area. But even beyond that, he comes with great experience in the area, and he's putting his life on the line for the good of his country and the good of the world. So we thank you very much for coming today, and we thank you for coming today, and we thank you for coming today. We really appreciate the testimony that both uh, Ms. Harbury gave and uh, Mr. Reyes gave. So with that, we're going to move to panel two, and we wish you well in all these endeavors. Thank you. <coughs> panel two would come forward. Okay, we, we're going to have Mr. McMasters uh, there and uh, Carlos Salinas uh, next and Kate Doyle. Okay, if you'd uh, raise your right hand, ladies and gentlemen, you swear the testimony you're about to give to this subcommittee is the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. The clerk will note all three witnesses affirmed. We'll begin with Paul K. McMasters, the First Amendment Ombudsman for the Freedom Forum. Mr. McMasters. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and the members of the committee for uh, uh, asking me here today and inviting me to uh, give a press perspective on uh, H.R. 2635, the Human Rights Information Act. Uh, I have three, uh, worked for three decades in daily journalism. Uh, and presently serve as a member of the Freedom of Information Committees, uh, both the American Society of Newspaper Editors and the Society of Professional Journalists. I'd like to start my remarks by asking a question. How should the United States government approach the enormous problem of declassifying national security documents? And although that is not the immediate subject of H.R. 2635, it is the major issue lurking beneath the surface of the bill. And in raising this broader issue, I do not mean to suggest, as this previous panel has attested, that the subject of human rights violations in Guatemala and Honduras is unimportant. I think the sponsors of the legislation have set out compelling findings demonstrating why the public interest would be served by the release of additional documents. There is an important aspect of this broader issue, however, that must be kept in short, sharp focus as these matters are deliberated. A vital public interest also is served by the press providing a constant and credible flow of information between government and the people. The press can only do that effectively, however, when common sense policies are in place for the declassification of secret records. Historically, a culture of secrecy within the federal government has thwarted the press's efforts to get information to the public. That has adversely influenced the public's confidence in uh, government, which in turn has a negative impact on elected officials' ability to make uh, public policy. I hope we all agree that maximum access to government information and a presumption of openness by government officials will work to improve government and assure the vitality of our democracy. To do otherwise is to foster paranoia and conspiracy theories on the part of the public and a lack of accountability on the part of the government. Everyone who has looked at the classification process in the United States has agreed that we continue to classify more records than require protection in the interest of national security. The backlog of documents awaiting declassification is measured in the billions of pages. The resources available for declassification are limited. The issue continues to be 
how do we best apply the available resources so as to provide the most relevant information at the earliest possible date? The President, as you know, has the power to direct agencies to declassify documents on subjects of his choosing, although exercising that, that power is easier said than done. The Congress can elect, enact laws, but legislation is an unwieldy and imperfect instrument for controlling and directing the classification process from a day-to-day -day basis. The public theoretically has a voice in such matters, but it rarely counts. What is needed is a more systematic way of assessing priorities for declassification. I note that the Government Secrecy Act of 1997 is pending before the Government Reform and Oversight Committee. I would like to call the subcommittee's attention to one element of that proposal. Section 5C of the bill would establish a 12-member National Declassification Advisory Committee. That advisory committee would, among other things, make recommendations concerning declassification priorities and activities. A broadly based advisory committee is one way to collect and blend the views of the executive branch, the Congress, the press, academics, historians, interest groups, and others. As currently drafted, the membership of the advisory committee would be heavily populated with academics. I might suggest other points of view be representing, represented, including the press and public interest groups like the National Security Archive and the Federation of American Scientists. Government information disclosure activities, like the Freedom of Information Act, already suffer from a shortage of resources. We have to find a way to support declassification in a way that does not undermine the disclosure of current information. I don't have to remind the members of the committee or the chairman that everyone pays a price for secrecy, as we've heard in this previous panel. In the past, no one paid attention to the actual costs either. This is one reason why we face such an enormous burden in dealing with the mountains of secrets that have built up in the past. Sooner or later, we are going to have to pay the cost for declassifying most of that information. In the meantime, we are creating 10,000 secrets a day and spending more than $5 billion a year maintaining as many as 10 billion pages of secrets. And as uh, the committee uh, alluded to um, uh, previously, uh, one and a half billion of those dockets, documents are, are more than 25 years old. No one questions the need for secrecy of some government information, but the need for some secrecy does not justify all secrecy. And we all pay too high a price for excessive secrecy. It deprives both the public and policymakers of needed information impoverishes public discourse and dialogue, reduces the sweep and scope of intelligence analysis, erodes public confidence in government at all levels, drains resources from real intelligence gathering, interferes with scientific and technological innovations and development, retards economic competitiveness, expends billions of tax dollars each year, and as we have heard, allows brutal things to go on. Uh, in our society and other societies. Common sense disclosure of classified material ensures good governments by making officials accountable, it encourages confidence in government and leaders, and it enlivens public debate that engenders sound, supported policy. In other words, it fulfills the Jeffersonian principle of an informed citizenry making democracy work. We have no choice but to set priorities and assign resources to deal with the de decisions made in the past. H.R. 2635 is a useful proposal in advancing that mandate because it makes us confront, confront a series of important public policy questions surrounding declassification and openness in government. I appreciate the opportunity to appear before the committee and speak about uh, the general uh, considerations uh, on having uh, a presumption of openness uh, in our society and in our uh, government. And I can't help but observe, after having heard uh, the gripping testimony of the earlier panel, that if these good people have the resolve to dig up the bodies in their countries, common decency should have a bureaucracy in the United States to dig up the records uh, in the bowels 
of their basements and bring them uh, forward to help them solve this problem. Thank you, sir. Well, Mr. McMasters, I appreciate that very eloquent statement uh, that you have made. And uh, you might tell us a little bit about the Freedom Forum. Uh, sir, the Freedom Forum is a foundation uh, dedicated to uh, free press, uh, free speech, and uh, free spirit. Uh, all of which apply in this uh, matter before this subcommittee. Uh, it is uh, a foundation designed for information and educational purposes. It does not uh, take positions on legislation, uh, and it does not lobby, but it allows its First Amendment ombudsman, uh, being me, uh, the opportunity to speak before such bodies uh, on these issues when invited. Well, we thank you, and if you can stay, we'll have some questions of all three of you. Uh, Carlos Salinas is with our neighbor up Pennsylvania Avenue here with Amnesty International. I suspect that's one of the most highly respected organizations by members of Congress on both sides of the aisle. Amnesty International has been in the forefront of uh, trying to help achieve human rights under very difficult situation. So we appreciate you coming here and sharing your thoughts with us. Mr. Salinas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for this hearing on the Human Rights Information Act and for the support you and your staff have shown. We also appreciate the ranking member's support, especially his co-sponsorship of the legislation and that of his staff. We hope, Mr. Chairman, that you can promptly refer this bill to the full committee and your leadership is deeply appreciated. Amnesty International USA has registered the supports of tens of thousands of Americans from Maine to Hawaii and Florida to Alaska. Here before me are more than 7,000 letters addressed to members of Congress in support of the Human Rights Information Act. So far we've delivered seven times the amount of letters that you see here. And that in turn is just one third of the total number of letters we've received supporting the Human Rights Information Act for Congress, 150,000 letters in total. We've also have made worry dolls. Our students across the land have made little figurines of brightly colored yarn such as this one. They've made 12,000 of them last spring in, in support of exhuming the truth in Guatemala. To give you a sense of what 150,000 letters and 12,000 worry dolls look like, I've brought a picture with me that we'd like to give you a copy. And in it, we show what the, the fact that Americans support the Human Rights Information Act. And if that weren't enough of a reason, I do have three additional compelling reasons why we think you should be able to support wholeheartedly the Human Rights Information Act. The first is that the Human Rights Information Act is pro-family. While the term is not usually used to describe such initiatives, this bill is pro-family in a very profound way. The Human Rights Information Act will help families heal and achieve closure in these cases of horrific violence, where parts of the family have been literally and violently torn away. Guatemala violence left tens of thousands dead and tens of thousands disappeared. Honduras also suffered, but not on such a massive scale. The pain has not healed, in part because the whole truth is not known. Families have not recovered the bodies of the disappeared and haven't been, even been able to give them a decent burial. By releasing this information, we can help these families heal. If we can help them heal, why should we not do that? The second reason to support the Human Rights Information Act is that it will fight crime. We're not talking about dozens of murders, but about the wholesale slaughter of entire villages, the mutilation of ba babies, the forced participation of families it off. The thugs and criminals who have, did, have done this have never been punished. Releasing information will help investigators and could help lead to the prosecution of these thugs. This will stop the criminals from further crimes and may deter others. But this is of course a lot of talk. I want to show you something. This shirt was found by the skeleton of a five-year-old boy in Alta Verapaz in Guatemala. The criminals who are responsible for the killing of this young boy and 140 others have never faced a court. Those who aided and abetted the crime have never faced the courts. Surely we must put an end to that. Surely we must ensure that those responsible face the courts and go to jail where they belong. The third reason to support the Human Rights Information Act, sir, is that it will strengthen democracy. The civilian authorities have made repeated commitments to prosecuting the offenders. We should assist, insist on that and make clear that the time is now for prosecutions. These will strengthen the rule of law and ultimately democracy. 
These three reasons are important now more than ever as Honduras and Guatemala try to overcome their violent legacies. Investigators still trigger threats and attacks. The panel before us, all three of those courageous individuals have received death threats. Mr. Reyes, just a few days ago, received a direct death threat. Honduras lost human rights defender Ernesto Sandoval to an assassin in February, while Guatemalan auxiliary bishop Juan Jose Girardi Conedera was murdered just three Sundays ago. As in the past, in neither case has justice been served. U.S. survivors like Meredith Larson, Sister Diana Ortiz, and Jennifer Harbury all have filed freedom of information requests only to learn that this process isn't very useful. The relatives of disappeared American priest Father James Carney received reams of blacked out documents. Father Carney's sister, Eileen, and her husband, Joe, joined Ms. Harbury and I in a 1995 meeting with the National Security Council director and the State Department's top human rights official, John Shattuck. At that meeting, both officials said they'd get us a declassification proposal in a month or so. That was the last we heard. Eileen's been waiting 18 years to give a decent burial to her brother. How much longer will she be kept waiting? The issue is that stark. And you know, when discussing this issue, we're frequently told that the problem with human rights activists is that we tend to pretend, uh, pre present things way too starkly. That we tend to present things and it's either black or white. Well, maybe that's because when we ask for truth, all we get are black documents or white documents. This is not useful, yet this is what some would dare call uh, declassification. Passing the Human Rights Information Act could be one of the best contributions the United States can make as we end the 20th century. It will help families, it will fight crime, it will strengthen democracy. It will also honor the legacy of heroes such as Ernesto Sandoval and Monsignor Girardi, who dedicated and ultimately sacrificed their lives for truth. This here is Monsignor Girardi. His is clearly the side of the struggle on which we all belong, on which you and the rest of the U.S. Congress belong. The American people want the Human Rights Information Act passed. For the sake of Monsignor Gerardi and Ernesto Sandoval, all the courageous human rights defenders who are struggling to make their world a safer place, and for the sake of the survivors and tomorrow's children, we urge you to please pass the Human Rights Information Act. Thank you very much. Well, we thank you very much. Uh, that uh, illustration of the all black and all white is certainly <laughs> compelling. I remember documents I've tried to get as a congressional committee chairman, and uh, they treat us just like they treat every other citizen around the country. And I think we've seen a little of that when they aren't here to testify. Uh, Ms. Doyle, uh, we're delighted to uh, have you here as uh, the third panelist, and uh, you're a foreign policy analyst for the National Security Archive. You might want to tell us a little bit about that organization, and then go ahead and summarize your testimony. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee. On behalf of the Archive, I'm very pleased to be here before you and to discuss the bill that is before you today. On listening to the testimony that we've heard this morning already, I, I, I think there are two areas that I could discuss with you briefly that would, would add to what you have already heard about the importance of the Human Rights Information Act. One is to place the bill, the introduction of the bill, into a broader context of recent changes in the overall secrecy system of the United States uh, and show you how the Human Rights Information Act fits into that pattern of making advances on breaking down the secrecy quite nicely. And the second area I think I could touch upon is the archives experience in working with three truth commissions, all of Central America, over the last five or six years, uh, and tell you a little bit about what their, res uh, the results of their request to the U.S. government for information has been. First, Chairman Horn, a little, a little background on the, on the archive. The, the National Security Archive is an independent, nonprofit research institute and a library uh, founded in 1985 by journalists and scholars, uh, which obtains declassified documents through the Freedom of Information Act on issues concerning national security and foreign policy, and then makes them available to the public through the library and through published collections. The Archive's interest in this bill derives then from our long-standing commitment to public access, to 
helping try to open the secret files on a variety of issues, but it also lies in our close acquaintance and our work with Latin Americans, individuals and institutions, who have struggled to press their own governments for accountability, especially in the area uh, of human rights. On reading through the bill introduced by Representative Lantos and others, it appears to me that the, the act is perfectly consistent with the United States laws and policies that are currently reshaping our outdated secrecy and classification systems. During the Cold War, we fashioned a vast architecture of secrecy to protect our national security interests. Now we are designing a system for the post-Cold War era, one that acknowledges the need to preserve true secrets, uh, weapons specifications, war plans, while ensuring broad public access to government records. And as we rethink our culture of secrecy, we're slowly opening our Cold War archives to our own citizens and, and to the rest of the world. There have been a number of remarkable developments recently in this shift towards openness after the end of the Cold War, and both Congress and the executive branch have played an important role. Some of the recent efforts include, for example, the Congressional Initiative in 1991 to protect the integrity of the Foreign Relations of the United States series, which the State Department produces every year, uh, the definitive account, really, of U.S. diplomatic history. Congress passed a law in 91 to protect this series in response to complaints from historians who were compiling these uh, uh, histories and who found that government secrecy was barring them from producing truthful and comprehensive ha accounts of United States history. Another initiative from Congress was the John F. Kennedy Assassination Records Acts, which was passed in 1992 and, and designed by Congress to open the secret archives on the Kennedy assassination to public scrutiny. The, the law created an extraordinary independent panel of historians to review and oversee the declassification process, something that's important to think about today because the Human Rights Information Act tries to set up the same kind of oversight, oversight uh, process. President Clinton has also been, I think, at the forefront of trying to challenge the excessive secrecy of the past. Uh, he has signed off on three very seminal executive orders, one of which, for example, in 1994, required the release of almost 45 million pages from the National Archives, most of which concerned World War II. I think this release represented the largest single declassification in the history of the United States. Uh, he signed an executive order on releasing satellite imagery and uh, finally in 1995 signed off on a presidential directive that was really the first post-Cold War directive on the overall classification system of national security information in the United States. The, uh, the government's own inf information oversight office, which I believe will testify after our panel, called this executive order a radical departure from the secrecy policies of the past, uh, for it requires automatic declassification of many historically valuable documents. And finally, the Moynihan Report, which was uh, issued last year, condemns the contemporary secrecy system as excessive, expensive, anachronistic, and dangerous to democracy, and argues that Congress needs to play a greater role in the classification and declassification process. Paralleling these, these broad initiatives on openness has been, at the same time, a series of targeted declassifications on a range of important issues. The Kennedy assassination was one. Uh, in addition to those documents, these targeted declassifications have resulted in the release of the intelligence community's national intelligence estimates, or NIEs on the Soviet Union, for example. Thousands of formerly secret records on the American POW and MIAs. Uh, DOE's holdings on human radiation experiments and the Venona intercepts, which described Soviet espionage in the 1940s. A new bill currently before Congress would open U.S. archives on Nazi war crimes. All of these efforts add up to what I believe is a really radical transformation 
of, of United States secrecy policy since the end of the Cold War. And it's, it's, it's happened on these two tracks. On the one hand, executive action and changes in the law have brought about comprehensive reform in the overall system. And at the same time, there have been mounting demands for more focused declassification on subjects of great public interest or urgency. Targeted releases of discrete document collections, like records concerning human rights abuses in Latin America, which we would be provided to the investigating bodies that so desperately need them, are, we believe, complementary actions that Congress and the President can take concurrently with an examination of the overall secrecy system. And finally, the, the Human Rights Information Act is consistent with efforts to open secret files on human rights abuses in Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, I have to say that this administration, with congressional support and pressure, which has been vital, has done more than any other to help clarify the past by declassifying crucial U.S. records on human rights abuses in such countries as El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras. In doing so, the administration has confronted some of the thorniest questions there are regarding the declassification of sensitive security matters. And Guatemala offers a case in point. In, in 1986, excuse me, in 1996, President Clinton released his Intelligence Oversight Board report on Guatemala, along with thousands of, of declassified documents. The report contained an unprecedented description of U.S. intelligence operations in a foreign country as well as critical new information on human rights abuses in Guatemala. What is the lesson of its release? It is simply that the government can arrive at an appropriate balance between national security and the public's interest in a matter of profound sensitivity, like intelligence operations overseas. Despite these good intentions, however, the government's record is not consistent. Uh, the Archive is in a somewhat unique position to report on U.S. efforts to provide human rights information. Since 1992, we have been working with three different official human rights investigative bodies in Central America, the UN Commission for the Truth in El Salvador, uh, the Office of the National Commissioner for Human Rights in Honduras, Dr. Leo Valladares' office, and the Guatemalan Historical Clarification Commission, which is Guatemala's version of the Truth Commission. All three of these entities have formally requested human rights information from the United States government. And in each instance, the U.S. response has been vastly different. When the U.N. Truth Commission for El Salvador approached the Bush administration in 1992, for example, strong congressional pressure convinced the White House to establish an interagency working group to assist the commission with access to documents. Yet by the time this UN Truth Commission issued its report in March of 93, little information of value had been provided to the staff from US agency files. In fact, when President Clinton subsequently declassified some 12,000 documents on El Salvador later that year, in November 93, members of the Truth Commission, now disbanded, realized that significant material had been withheld from them during their investigations. The Historical Clarification Commission of Guatemala has also sought U.S. human rights information in support of its work. And to date, the response of the Clinton administration has been timely and substantive. By mid-April of this year, that's some six months after the Guatemala Truth Commission's initial request, the government turned over packages of documents, I think some 12 packages from the State Department, AID, CIA, and Department of Defense, to the Guatemalan Truth Commission. Although there are still significant gaps in the collection, and the information uh, that the Commission needs continues, to, some information continues to be withheld, this release does represent a serious effort on the government's part. The Human Rights Commissioner of Honduras, however, has had a, an entirely different experience. And as he told you today, that has been really bitterly disappointing to him. For the Archive, these three experiences, the, the, the work that these commissions have done and the responses they've received from the U.S. government, is, is perfect proof that we need some kind of legislative mechanism to standardize, standardize this process. Uh, and, and we feel that the Human Rights Information Act is the appropriate legislative remedy 
for what has until now been really an ad hoc process in the hands of the federal agencies alone. The bill simply brings the force of law to bear on the release of critical human rights information, and it does so in a simple and uncomplicated manner. One, by assuring the timeliness of the release of the records. Two, by defining declassification standards, and doing so, by the way, by using language from a JFK Assassination Records Act, which has already been passed by Congress. And finally, by ensuring oversight through an interagency panel, again, already established in the law. Mr. Chairman, many of the democratic nations of Latin America and the Caribbean are struggling right now to reject the region's legacy of violence and turn the terms of newly signed peace accords into reality. But they face grave challenges. Throughout the region, terrible internal conflict led to gross abuses against hundreds of thousands of men, women, and children during decades past. Today, these same countries face the awesome task of building peaceful and truly civil societies out of what was left to them when the killing stopped. We can help them. The name of the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission says it all to me. Truth does indeed come before reconciliation. The United States can give Latin America some of the basic facts and truths they need like bricks and mortar for the construction of their new societies. I appreciate this opportunity to testify before you today, and I look forward to working with you, Mr. Chairman, and with your staff to move the Human Rights Information Act forward. Thank you. Uh, we thank you uh, for that uh, very full statement. One of the things you noted, Ms. Doyle, and uh, I sort of tend to agree with it, but a lot of people don't, and that's the benefits of targeted declassification. Mm -hmm. And I'd be curious what members of the panel, Mc Mr. McMasters might have a different view, and I'm told people in the archival community are concerned that targeted declassification separates the documents from their context and makes them less useful in the long run. Mm -hmm. What would you say to that criticism? Well, there's a couple of issues here. One is, and this is something that Mr. McMasters would probably be interested in, the, how the targeted declassification affects or impacts users of the Freedom of Information Act. And I can tell you that the National Security Archive, as one of the most prolific users of the Freedom of Information Act, has never seen a um, clear difference in the time it has taken for us to receive documents in response to our FOIA requests due to any kind of targeted declassification effort that was going on. That is a roundabout way of saying that the FOIA is so slow um, that I can't think of a time when a targeted declassification has ever actually hurt FOIA requesters out there by delaying the declassification of other documents. With regard to the issue of documents being removed from their archival context, uh, one of the wonderful things about targeted declassification is that it does put these documents out into the public realm, and they will be followed by the overall declassification efforts of the, of, of the government. And one of the things I was trying to point out in my testimony is that these two things can coexist. The executive order that President Clinton signed in 95 can help to promote this automatic declassification of older records, which will open the National Archives in general. And these targeted declassification efforts can, can identify specific small sets of documents to which there is an, for which there is an urgent need and get those out in the forefront. Uh, but the, the older documents will catch up with them eventually. Mr. McMasters, how do you feel about that? Well, I, I don't disagree at all. In fact, I, I fully support uh, what Ms. Doyle says uh, about uh, targeted declassification. Uh, but I would like to add to that that it only works uh, as long as you provide the resources uh, to do that. I, uh, you'll hear more from Steve Garfinkel in the next uh, uh, panel. But I talked uh, uh, last week with some folks over there. And uh, this legislation... Uh, puts the, the uh, uh, duty for, the responsibility for uh, appeals with uh, the Interagency Security Classification Access Panel, 
which uh, so thus far has stayed on top of its docket, but it's only considered 77 cases. Uh, I assure you, uh, knowing the intelligence community uh, and its resistance to this kind of legislation and this targeted release, uh, under it, when this law gets passed, that ISCAP will uh, wind up with all sorts of new burdens and responsibilities, and there will be no way that it will meet the kinds of deadlines that this legislation sets. Uh, the other thing about ad hoc uh, declassification of, of uh, material is that, in essence, it, uh, it gives information to people who have a ticket to the House or the Senate. And that's great, uh, especially when you have such a pressing issue as we have before us today. But a lot of times we don't know how pressing an issue is until the documents are released. So hand in hand with targeted release, there has to be uh, resources made available and a large big picture approach uh, to the release of information, especially in this post-Cold uh, War era. Uh, Mr. Salinas, do you have any comments on this question? Yes, sir. Um, I just would like to remind all of us, as uh, Dr. Valladares uh, so eloquently put it, the clock is ticking. So the targeted declassification certainly um, is appropriate given the struggle that human rights defenders and all people in Guatemalan and Honduran societies are facing. But this bill also in Section 6 does set up a process for other human rights records uh, in Latin America, uh, in the Caribbean, so that if, a, if the highest ranking judicial authority or a duly constituted truth commission requests the documents, this uh, process set forth in the bill would in fact be triggered. So it does set up an order for uh, the review of these documents. Um, and one thing I would like to um, point out too in terms of Mr. McMaster's uh, current point about uh, the appeals panel meeting its deadline, the appeals panel as, as far as this legislation does not have any uh, firm deadline, it just says to promptly review, uh, but it is uh, required only after its review has been completed then it has a deadline to publish its findings. So in terms of uh, having b being forced to do something in a time which it cannot do, luckily this bill uh, does not uh, constrain it in that way. Any other thoughts on this matter that haven't been put on the record? Uh, in Section 5, um, we all worry about uh, privacy, and rightly so. But I, uh, and I, I'm sure Ms. Doyle has seen too, how often the uh, use of privacy considerations is used to delay and deny the release of information. Uh, one of the best examples of that, of course, is uh, 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 Terry Anderson, who was held seven years by kidnappers in Beirut, uh, and when he finally was released and uh, being uh, uh, continually rebuffed by federal agencies on trying to get access to information about his captivity, uh, would receive information that said that uh, he couldn't have this information because it might violate the privacy of uh, the uh, terrorists who were holding him captive. Uh, I would just point out to the committee that uh, there is uh, a potential for abuse in uh, Section 5's uh, accept, uh, exceptions uh, of allowing an unwarranted invasion of personal the, uh, privacy. I'm looking at page 6, line 17. Is that the one you see that yes. is the most problem? Okay. Yes, Just want to make sure we have it pinpointed. Uh, what are your thoughts in legislating specific information requests? Obviously, we've got a problem with that. It takes us years to get to this point, but I just wondered, did, do you feel within the agency that's about to testify, within the language of this law, if it became a law, uh, are there sufficient places for priority setting, shall we say, of what is really urgent? and we're talking about human rights cases being really urgent, uh, but someone else might have an interesting historical view of something. They're going to, they'd like the documents to write, and they put one thing aside for the other. And should these, this law and the existing law uh, have that kind of power, or what do you suggest? Or have we, have we got a sufficient apparatus to make those judgments right now? Well, 
I have to say that uh, I am, like uh, you, Mr. Chairman, very disappointed that some agencies uh, chose uh, not to appear and to be a part of this dialogue. Uh, unfortunately, that is all too typical. And uh, if there is one thing that, uh, that uh, the intelligence community has been very good at, that is, uh, uh, despite whatever legislation may come down, uh, still protecting, uh, as we uh, pointed out, billions of pages of information, a lot of which really does not need uh, to remain secret. And uh, I, I do think that it will be difficult uh, for any legislation passed to penetrate that culture of secrecy. Uh, th and that is why legislation is needed, because I don't think uh, the initiatives that uh, Ms. Doyle, for instance, pointed out that have been happening here lately uh, would ever have happened if they would have been left up uh, to the Intelligence Committee to bring forward. There is no incentive for it on their part. All the incentives are for keeping things secret. Nobody gets punished for overclassifying. Many people get punished for uh, underclassifying. One of our problems is that uh, a lot of agencies say, well, we just don't have the staff to do all this that you want us to do. What's the best way we ought to handle that? Just take a percent off their budget when they uh, haven't at least given documents out within an X month period. In my opening remarks, I noted my chagrin a few years ago when we got into this of the FBI taking four years for the average citizen to get their file. That's just crazy. And uh, we're going to have to get back to this, uh, I can see, because they ought to be asking the president for money. And if he won't appropriate it, let's finger him. On the other hand, if they don't ask for it, let's finger them. You have a comment on that? There have been a number of very interesting, creative solutions to that problem. One being, uh, I remember someone came and spoke before the Moynihan Commission a couple of years back talking about how the classifiers should be tithed. Essentially, the agency should, agencies should divvy up you know, a, a buck a page for anything that they make secret, thereby creating the budget later on uh, for the work that they would need to do and the staff time they would need to put in to declassify these same documents. Um, but I, it's true that, as Mr. McMaster's pointed out, the government's own information oversight board or center, excuse me, uh, office that Mr. Garfinkel will testify from today has pointed out the great uh, cost of maintaining this information secret uh, with comparison to the, the much smaller cost of opening these files up and making them public. So I, I really don't think that's an issue. There is another thing that uh, I unfortunately see too un, uh, infrequently, and that is uh, members of oversight committees in Congress uh, not holding uh, agencies' feet to the fire on their FOI and declassification efforts. Uh, uh, often, when they come before them for budget hearings and that sort of stuff, no questions are asked about how, what sort of backlog they have in providing information and stuff. I think that could be a very effective tool that Congress can uh, use, especially in budget hearings and that sort of thing. I think that's a good suggestion, and I'll have the staff share whatever we know on this with the various appropriations subcommittees. Uh, that uh, ought to be done more regularly, and it ought to be done by the authorizing committees. One of your problems with the authorizing committees is they all get on those committees because they want to do good by that agency. They want to either feed people or help people or do something, and they see anything as detracting from that in terms of human resources mm -hmm. as not feeding people or not helping people on welfare. Mm -hmm. And uh, that either-or situation is just plain wrong. We ought to be thinking of a little food for thought, which would go across all agencies mm -hmm. and find out, as you've suggested, what the truth is and uh, not sit on these records. I know one case in the late 50s in one intelligence agency, uh, they actually classified an issue of the New York Times top secret and threw it into the file. Now, mm -hmm. I don't know what you do because nobody put on it uh, what particular offending article was in there that should be top secret. But, you know, that got the silly season in some places of just over-classification. And that's why I cited that First World War example. That just ought to be released, period. And uh, unless they have some hugely good reason, and if they do, they ought to, the president likes reading history, send it up to him, have him decide it. Uh, but we need some place where the buck stops 
and action can be taken with people that have enough common sense on those boards uh, to do that. Uh, do you have any uh, questions, gentlemen from Ohio? <coughs> uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, apropos of your comments, Mr. Chairman, when you uh, consider the testimony we've received about newspaper articles being uh, classified, uh, travel descriptions of countries being classified. Um, it's quite possible that uh, there's an agency strategy here at work which classifies everything and then when declassification is sought, releases material that's irrelevant, non-responsive, contradictory or misleading. So people wonder why we never get to the truth. Um, I, I think we need to once again uh, support this legislation because it helps to more closely delineate the responsibilities of information release. Would Mr. McMaster's like to comment on that? Well, I think you're absolutely right. And uh, I, would, I would repeat what I uh, mentioned earlier, that in addition to that possible strategy, um, I think the, the overriding reason for that overclassification and excess, uh, excessive secrecy has to do really with the culture of secrecy that has grown up uh, over the years and uh, the fact that there are no incentives uh, to do otherwise. Somehow we have to provide uh, incentives for uh, folks in the intelligence community and in that bureaucracy uh, to do the right thing when it comes to classification. Uh, that is one of the findings of the Moynihan Commission, and I think it's embodied in the Government Secrecy Act, that there is established the uh, principle that secrecy is a form of regulation. So Congress, therefore, has a very uh, positive role to play there. Also, uh, it, uh, that legislation uh, brings up the idea of life cycle of a secret. And I think that is very important. Uh, some life cycles will go longer and some shorter, but at least uh, those doing the classifi classifying will have uh, some idea of what should uh, be held secret for a specific period of time, what needs to be held secret for a longer period of time. I, I think uh, your point's well taken, and I, I would respond by saying that um, in, in all of these proceedings, I think it's good for us to reflect on how is this widespread secret, secrecy consistent w in a democratic society? Uh, this is a democracy. You know, these countries in Central America, Latin America, and other places around the world, they have different types of government systems. Certainly, uh, all of them may aspire to democratic principles at times. But we pride ourselves in the United States of America as upholding a democratic tradition, and with that, an openness. We're very proud of that. People fought for that, people died for that, so that we might enjoy this democracy. When the country was founded, it wasn't uh, we the people of the United States, shh. It was well, we the people of the United States in order to form a more perfect union to establish justice, among other things. So th there is a, we're, we're confronted here with some responsibilities to protect national security, but at the same time, we have to balance that with the requirements for openness. And we have to make sure that those agencies which are charged with the responsibility of national security do not use that as a pretext for covering up human rights violations, which is basically what this hearing is all about and what the need for the legislation is all about. Now, I would ask to, uh, I'd like to ask Mr. Salinas, uh, in looking at the CIA's written testimony, it uh, states uh, that Section 5 of the bill that's proposed requires, and this is a quote from their testimony, inordinately high showings of evidence incorporating convoluted public interest balancing tests but ignoring totally the fact that families and relatives of sources remain perpetual targets for retaliation. So they're raising the issue that people's uh, human rights could be violated by the release of the information. How, would you how do you respond to that? Well, I would ask them to review Section 5 again. Uh, Section 5 is quite clear 
uh, in setting forth the standards so that uh, people who have uh, that people who have collaborated with the U.S. government, their lives aren't threatened, uh, that they are not harmed. Uh, Section 5, uh, as Mr. McMaster's pointed out, also has some provisions that we in Amnesty also are very uncomfortable with in terms of uh, protecting privacy. I mean, I, I think the people who have participated in violations should be uh, protected to have a fair trial and should have that protected, not necessarily their privacy, uh, unless it's uh, as part of a fair trial. Uh, so it's, it's actually uh, troubling um, to hear that, uh, especially when uh, the move is to recognize that there is a public interest. Um, you know, the Jeffersonian principle of an informed citizenry is, is certainly alive and well. Uh, and I don't see anything convoluted about anyone trying to balance the public interest. Uh, with national security. I think that those are important principles. And furthermore, uh, the U.S. government has already approved the, the standards that are set forth in Section 5. This was part of uh, the JFK uh, Assassinations Review Act of 1992, so um, it's, it's uh, almost puzzling to see why that section would be, uh, you know, would be troubling given that it's, had, it's created no problems so far that we're aware of. The, uh, uh, in, in your testimony now, you mentioned that the fam family of Father Carney, who disappeared in Honduras, was promised a declassification proposal by the National Security Council in 1995, and they still have no information from the NSC. Are Father Carney's relatives still waiting uh, for information from the U.S. government? Absolutely, they're still waiting. Uh, they recently received uh, a proposal from the administration that was not uh, germane to that previous request, which they haven't so mentioned. It wasn't only the National Security Council, it was also the top State Department human rights officer, John Shattuck, who promised uh, this, uh, this proposal. Uh, we wrote several letters uh, asking them uh, what happened to this proposal that was going to come in a month or so, and we still have, have heard nothing. Um, and uh, the, the relatives of Father Carney are still waiting. They've been offered a proposal, which um, they're looking over, but uh, it's certainly not what we were uh, expect. Uh, we were promised way back in 1995. Uh, I, I would like to uh, shift uh, attention to another matter because I know that Amnesty International has been involved in this. In my opening remarks, I cited the case of uh, uh, four church women, Maura Clark, Jean Donovan, Ida Ford, and Dorothy Kazel, who were uh, abducted, raped, and shot to death on December 2, 1980 in uh, El Salvador. Uh, we've learned recently in, a, um, in uh, news reports that there is new information which suggests that uh, high-ranking officials of the uh, Salvadoran army uh, uh, may have been involved in uh, ordering the executions. Uh, you're familiar with those reports, of course. Yes. Has Amnesty International sought uh, further information uh, from the government in connection with, uh, with those new reports. Absolutely, and in fact, that 1995 meeting that I alluded to, we were also joined by the nieces of Sister Ida Ford, who exasperatingly asked, how can you keep me from knowing this information when my daughters want to know why they'll never meet their grand aunt and why, her grand, why our grand aunt's been killed? Uh, they were also promised this proposal to declassify. Uh, they too are waiting. They were, we, we were told in this meeting, and they were told in this meeting, uh, that they would have to wait in, their, in line just like anyone else uh, for information. Who told uh, them that? It was one of the two officials. My memory is fuzzy about exactly which one officials of Officials of which government? Of the U.S. government. Uh, it was either Mr. Richard Feinberg or Mr. John Shattuck who were trying to explain That how they would have to wait in line to yes, get information. because other people also wanted to uh, find out uh, information. Uh, you know, and this was very, they were very deeply insulted by this. They've been waiting since 1980 to find out the truth about uh, those horrible uh, rapes and murders. Uh, you're, are you familiar with documents that the, uh, were said to have been in the possession of the State Department that could have, uh, that, that could possibly implicate the uh, Salvadoran High Command? 
I know that um, the, the relatives have insisted that there are documents uh, in possession um, by the agencies, and I believe that does include the, the State Department, that they've been seeking and they've still been denied. So I know that that is still a pending matter. Uh, I was troubled to read in the New York Times that an official was claiming that they had already gotten everything they could get. That's, that's nonsense. Would, would, this, would this legislation enable cases such as this to receive more light of day? Well, we would hope so. It depends really on uh, what the process in Section 6 is uh, interpreted. Um, I think that could be one of the ways. The way the legislation is structured right now, it only uh, releases the documents in Guatemala and Honduras and only right. those uh, requested by the high judicial authorities from uh, either other nations or the duly constituted truth commissions. I, I, I believe it would set a useful precedent, of course, and uh, I just want it said that uh, while we have legislation here that deals with Honduras and Guatemala, that there are cases that are relevant because some of the staging for support of, of um, uh, the tragedies in El Salvador happened from uh, Honduras. And so there is a connection there. Absolutely. Um, Even uh, there's a, a case from 1973 from Chile of a U.S. citizen, uh, Mr. Horman, that was uh, disappeared and, and subsequently met, murdered. His father went to the grave never finding out what exactly happened to his son. And his wife still wants the information. I want to uh, submit for the record, Mr. Chairman, this uh, article, Salvadorans who slew American nuns now say they had orders. Um, the family's still looking for information. Uh, this kind of legislation helps to set a useful precedent to get information. And I also want those families to know that uh, we will persist in our efforts to bring justice in this matter and will not stop until we are able to determine uh, the truth of it. And that means finally getting access to information that is currently being frustrated by the Department of State. So thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Salinas, uh, Mr. Uh, McMasters, and Ms. Doyle for your testimony and for your um, work in this important area. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, without objection, this document will be placed in the record at this point. Uh, I would also ask that we ask the Department of State uh, the knowledge on another case, and that leads me back to Mr. Salinas. Do you keep any records in Amnesty International with people who have been assassinated when they're advocating democracy? Unfortunately, the list of heroes who have given up their lives for the sake of democracy and for the sake of human rights is long. Uh, throughout the world, human rights defenders under, are under increasing attack. It's ironic that this, the 50th year of the anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, we still have to defend the right to defend others. Human rights defenders are being killed throughout the world, and it's something that uh, efforts such as this can help prevent by putting the criminals who are behind this in jail. I'm going to ask for the files on uh, Professor uh, Francisco Pecarini, who was objecting to the left's uh, seizure of power and was advocating democracy, and he was killed three days before the national election in, in El Salvador. So I'm just curious what we know about that. And, sir, one thing uh, you had mentioned earlier about priority setting, and I think yeah. this bill recognizes a fundamental fact, and that is that democracies are still trying to build and activists are still trying to build a true respect for human rights in their countries. And what this bill sets out is one of the clearest priorities for declassification, and that is a priority for human rights protection. As you know, history is not static. It is moving. Truth commissions are come and go. We need to be able to make sure that when there is hopefully, God willing, a truth commission in Colombia, that there is a mechanism in place so that the information can be provided in an expedited fashion. Mm -hmm. I think that's well said, and I thank each of you for coming. Your testimony has been most helpful, and uh, if you have any other suggestions, uh, we'll keep the record open. Glad to uh, add anything. Uh, both the minority staff and the majority staff might well want to have other questions for the record on 
any of the panels. And uh, you're all under oath in answering those questions, and we appreciate any advice you can give us. So thank you for coming. We'll now move to panel three. Mr. Lee Strickland, Chief, Information Review Group, Central Intelligence Agency. Stephen Garfinkel, Director, Information Security Oversight Office, National Archives. I might add that as they're coming forward, I want to praise uh, two members of the executive branch, which they are, uh, for being here today. And uh, I'm sorry about uh, the other agencies that were asked that uh, decided they didn't want to testify, they didn't want to have a dialogue, and uh, we'll get back to them. If you have any uh, people that have come with you that might be answering any questions, we can swear them in now in one mass baptism here. So uh, if you would, uh, raise your right hand. Uh, do you swear that the testimony you're about to give this subcommittee is the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth? Yes. Clerk will note that both of the witnesses affirm the oath. And we'll begin with Mr. Strickland, the Chief Information Review Group, Central Intelligence Agency. We appreciate your coming and sharing your thoughts with us. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members. I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to uh, speak this morning as a representative of the CIA. Uh, I would like to preface my uh, written remarks with our agreement with uh, much of what we've heard this morning, uh, with the need for an informed citizenry, uh, that human rights abuses should never be tolerated, much less covered up, and that secrecy should never exist for the sake of secrecy. We believe, however, that we must be very careful that any statutory enactments do not erode access to critical intelligence information which the President and Congress need. And that is our concern with this bill. I would like to talk this morning about three particular aspects. I would like to look at our release accomplishments under existing law. I would like to look at some cost implications that we feel this bill would have. And I would like to look at the very real impact with this, which this bill will have on the continued ability to obtain intelligence information that we need. I'd like to speak briefly to these three points and then, if time permits, uh, discuss some statistics and metrics which I think will further explain our position. First, let me speak briefly about our record of accomplishments. It is my fear that the impetus for this legislation comes from perception that the CIA has released little, if any, information in regard to human rights. This is an issue and a, uh, a performance which we have discussed on a regular basis with our oversight committees. And I believe that the agency has gone to rather extraordinary lengths and resources to make information available. Unfortunately, as we heard from Dr. Valadares and others, it often is not the information that they need, but it is the information that we have available and we have gone to very great lengths to make it available. Let me give you several examples. In response to the request from members of the Carney family, we have undertaken uh, search efforts which I can only describe as leaving no stone unturned to find every bit of information that we have had. We even prepared a detailed assessments paper for the family, which attempted to interpret the information we had. And indeed, we have a continuing dialogue with the family members that we are trying to assist them to this very day in their efforts to learn where their family member may be buried, where the body may be. Second example, the DCI has personally met with Dr. Valadares and assured him that we would undertake every effort that we could to assist him. And that work continues today. Uh, Dr. Valadares is correct that we have not completed all of our work, but uh, we, have, we have a record of accomplishment and we are uh, committed to finishing that up uh, with records on Battalion 316 and the more recent 1997 Inspector General's report. And I can assure the committee that those documents will be forthcoming in the next matter of weeks. 
And third, I would like to highlight that my office has added fairly significant resources in the past months to address the many FOIA requests from average citizens and others. Uh, as we'll discuss later, if time permits, we have over 400 requests from members of the, of members of the public regarding Guatemala and Honduras. We have about an equal number regarding other human rights uh, matters in the Americas. All of these are underway, and the majority of them, indeed, have been completed. Second, let me talk very briefly about the cost implications of the bill. Our concern is that these special purpose statutes, no matter how important they appear, and how important they are indeed, tend to monopolize resources, build delays, and create inefficiencies and cost excesses. Let me give you several examples. Today, there are over 20 different venues under which information review and release takes place. Unfortunately, there is exactly one pool of resources to meet all of those needs. Just one program which we have heard mentioned here today, the JFK uh, program, has grown from a modest, specialized activity six years ago to an industry today which employs the equivalent of 35 full-time personnel. And the other inefficiency built into the system with multiple statutes or multiple requirements is that decisions in one program rarely have binding effect in another. So the government is faced with re-arguing each decision in different forums. That obviously creates great costs, inefficiencies, program costs, management costs, and legal costs. Let me last speak to the issue of source protection. What I want to emphasize today, that we are not here to raise what people sometimes term the mantra of intelligence sources and methods. We can't have this bill because it will affect sources and methods. That is not our argument today. I think it's a much more careful argument that I want to share with you. It was my thought that this bill actually presents a paradox. While the laudable objective, and I really agree that it is a laudable objective, to publicly disclose information on human rights will take place under standards that we believe will actually ensure that foreign nationals are not likely, not likely to continue to cooperate with American intelligence. The result will be that the United States, because of this statute we fear, will actually lose access to much of the information we need. I think a fair question is, why is this so? Why am I certain this is the case? The simple reason we believe is that the provisions of this bill, the exemption provisions, do not provide the confidentiality that sources or prospective sources demand. I am convinced that sources, individuals, knowing that ultimately, and depending upon future circumstances, that they, their families, or their friends will be exposed. They will not cooperate with that potential in mind. Let me give you, let me share with you a few points that came from my, my review of, of documents uh, that were responsive to Dr. Valadaris and others. We have documents where a human source is reporting on human rights. In the same document, he is reporting on narcotics information and other critical information. And in the same document, he then goes on to state how greatly concerned he is for his life and that if any of the information in this document leaks out, he will be dead. The source was so adamant about the danger that he insisted that it be reported back through intelligence channels. That one document, having human rights information, having counter-narcotics information, has right in the text the source's great fear for his life. So this is not a hypothetical discussion that we are talking about of risk here. There are any number of documents that I have seen in these cases where sources are literally fearful for their life. And that repeats in all of the programs. I can share with you several other vignettes on the JFK statute where we are discussing with the board the protection of the actual name of sources who are alive today and living in foreign countries. Not the information they provided, but the actual identity. 
and we are quite frankly concerned of their life, livelihood, and safety. The problem, of course, in all of this is how do you prove that their life is truly in danger? And that is one of our problems with this bill, is the standard of proof that is required it could be impossible to meet. Quite frankly and honestly, I cannot prove that a source, if his name or her name is disclosed, will be killed or their family will be endangered. The likelihood is there, the real likelihood, but we can't prove it. In sum, we are concerned that this bill will imperil our sources and the mission of the CIA to the detriment of the Congress and the President. To save the committee's time, uh, I won't go into uh, a long detail of some of the uh, uh, efforts we have undertaken, but I would like to point out just a few markers to give you an idea of the efforts that we have taken. In 1993, in response to congressional interest and the, on, and the request of the UN Truth Commission, the CIA undertook an exhaustive search on 32 specific human rights cases, 6,000 personnel hours, 1,800 documents identified, and over 50% of those were subsequently declassified. We've also undertaken e uh, efforts for the President's Intelligence Oversight Board with respect to congressional and NSC demands on Guatemala. With respect to Honduras, we have completed three of the special searches required by Dr. Valadares. Um, the uh, Father Carney request, for example, took 1,100 hours. Uh, we then undertook uh, five highly visible uh, human rights cases, which we call Honduras II. Similar exhaustive searches, over 500 hours. With respect to Honduras III, uh, that was General Valadez, Valadez uh, Alvarez, I'm sorry, excuse me. We invested several hundred additional hours. With respect to General Alvarez, I would like to add one point that I think would be very important. Dr. Valadares commented upon the relative paucity of documents on General Alvarez. And that is correct. I believe there were 20 or 21 documents. Uh, however, the request, of course, was limited to General Alvarez vis-a-vis -vis human rights issues. I think a fair reading of those documents would show that the CIA was very forthcoming because not only, as Dr. Valadares said, they point out that certain leftist groups were planning to assassinate government and military leaders in Honduras. But the released information also showed the totality of what we knew about General Alvarez, which was that he had repudiated the rule of law in Honduras and was planning similar extra-legal activities against the leftists. No, we did not have definitive information about what his plans were. But we did share with Dr. Valadares and with members of the public the human rights information that we had, indicating that, for whatever value it was, that he was intent upon using extra-legal means. I think what this shows and demonstrates is that we have a commitment to releasing that information that we do have. It's unfortunate in many cases that we don't have the definitive information. As my statement highlights, and I won't repeat it here, at that point in time, in the 1980s, human rights was not a central focus of CIA's mandate. And therefore, our reporting tended to be fragmentary and in the context of other intelligence priorities, typically leftist insurrection, etc. Therefore, when we look at a case such as Father Carney, we get peripheral reports by individuals reporting typically hearsay information that they had on Father Carney. For instance, we explained to the family that our intelligence showed three likely scenarios on Father Carney. One, that he died of starvation in the jungle with the Reyes Matas forces. Uh, two, that he had been killed and his body dismembered. Uh, three, that the military had otherwise uh, killed him. And this information was shared with the family with the additional data that we, the CIA, as an intelligence judgment, did not know which of those three scenarios were likely. But we had shared those scenarios with the family. 
I've continued my dialogue with the family. Uh, the, the members of the family have indicated an interest uh, quite understandably on any information we may have on the remains of the, uh, of the body, uh, which has never, to my understanding, has never been recovered. Uh, right now, as we speak, we are attempting to take the very, very limited information we have, and with some of our cartographers, we are trying to see if we can correlate some source information with actually a location on a, on a map. Uh, I, I can't promise that this will be successful or not. Uh, in fact, I'm not terribly sanguine that it will be, but we are trying to use every bit of intelligence information we have to assist them to the degree we can. Um, I think that, uh, with, with that, I would just like to emphasize, uh, you know, I, I believe our, our major points, which is, which are that I believe that the DCI has shown his commitment to ensuring that human rights information is made available from what we have today. In this regard, I would like to point out for the committee a, what I think is a revolution in the way that intelligence information on human rights is reported. Uh, before coming here to, to testify this morning, I uh, went through some of our recent systems and ran the term human rights. And I was quite amazed, I had understood this to be the case, but I was quite amazed to see the difference, in fact this is not just CI but rather the community at large, the way human rights reporting is being done today with what is commonly called tear lines and human rights information today in cables is written so that the substance can be separated from the classified information such as the source description and then the substance disseminated to appropriate human rights organizations and typically will say the Department of State is authorized to, uh, to disseminate the following information to human rights organizations. And then there is the substance, unclassified, that can be shared. I submit that this type of a process is much more efficient in making sure that human rights information is made available rather than a statutory provision which focuses on dissemination after the fact. A statutory program is never, I don't believe, going to be sufficiently time-sensitive to get the information that we need to the public. Thank you. Well, we thank uh, you for coming and sharing that with us, and uh, we can then have Mr. Garfinkel. We'll go to questions. Uh, Mr. Garfinkel, we're delighted to have you here. So uh, you're the director of the Information Security Oversight Office, and uh, I suspect that's a fairly unknown uh, agency within the executive branch, except by reporters, human rights activists, and an occasional member of Congress. So tell us a little bit about the history of the office, and uh, you have quite a rich background as a lawyer and counsel in records administration and GSA and the archives and so forth. So thank you for coming. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The Information Security Oversight Office has existed since 1978. Like our security classification system, it exists by executive order. We are a very small office responsible to the President for monitoring the system under which information is classified safeguarded and ultimately declassified. Given the focus of the legislation before the subcommittee today, I'm very pleased to appear before you to report on our progress in implementing this recently revised system for classified information. The most extraordinary provision of this new system is its requirement regarding the automatic declassification of information. Specifically, Section 3.4 of Executive Order 12958 provides that classified information within records of permanent historical value will be automatically declassified 25 years after its creation, unless the pertinent agency head 
can successfully demonstrate how particular information falls within one of the order's narrow enumerated exceptions. This provision is to take full effect on April 17th of the year 2000, five years from the date on which the President issued this executive order. Already this new classification and declassification has achieved some rather remarkable results. In the last two years, the agencies of the executive branch have declassified more than 400 million pages of permanently valuable government records. Of the more than 650 million pages that the executive branch has declassified since 1980, more than 70 percent of that total took place in just the past three years. Agencies that never previously contemplated large-scale declassification, like the CIA and the National Reconnaissance Office, now have in place productive declassification units. The Interagency Security Classification Appeals Panel, a new six-member panel representing the Secretaries of State and Defense, the Attorney General, the Director of Central Intelligence, the Archivist of the United States, and the Assistant to the President for National Security Affairs, has declassified in their entirety more than 70 percent of the documents that have come before it on appeal from agency decisions to keep those same documents classified. Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee, I can state with total confidence that the United States government stands far in the forefront among nations in the manner, timing, and extent to which it makes available to its citizens and to the general public its records of governance, including its formerly classified records. These indicators of progress do not mean that we have all the answers about our security classification system or that there aren't tremendous hurdles to clear. To be sure, the standards and goals established within the new executive order are unparalleled. We are not yet certain that every agency, or perhaps any agency, can achieve them. However, only if the targets are difficult can reaching them be noteworthy. I recognize that the focus of today's hearing is the specific legislation before the subcommittee and not the declassification system in general. While I am not appearing as the administration's witness on its position regarding the legislation, there is one issue concerning it that I would like to address briefly because it may not otherwise be discussed. That issue is the impact that legislation such as H.R. 2635 would have on the freedom of information and declassification processes within the executive branch if it becomes law. I address this without getting into the merits or demerits of this particular bill. Specifically, each time a new law gives priority to processing for public access records pertaining to one subject area, public access to government information in all other subject areas suffers. That is because the agencies of the executive branch have very limited human resources for processing records for public access. The same people who will be reviewing the records of an enacted H.R. 2635 for declassification would otherwise be reviewing the oldest freedom of information or mandatory review for declassification requests before their agencies. These requests, which may have been pending for several years, will necessarily be delayed for additional months or even longer. 
to those frustrated requesters, be they journalists, historians, students, or simply constituents, the public interest and access to the information that they are seeking will seem just as important as the public interest and access to the information at issue in this legislation. Once again, I appreciate the opportunity to be appear before you today, and I'll be happy to try to answer any questions you might have. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Garfinkel. Let me just start with some general line of questioning, because this has a lot of not only legislative interest, but the average citizen interest. Uh, and perhaps, Mr. Garfinkel, you can help me with this. Uh, in terms of the records that are eventually turned over to the National Archives by many agencies, do those include top secret records uh, from the Department of Defense, the Central Intelligence Agency? How is that handled? Uh, yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. Many of the permanently valuable records within the National Archives remain classified at all classification levels, including Now, top what are secret. those classification levels? Let's get that on the record. There are three classification levels. Top secret, which is the highest level and also represents the smallest quantity by far of classified information. Secret is the middle level, and confidential is the lowest of the three classification levels. Now, as I recall, there are other things like restricted, no foreign nationals may see, et cetera, even if they were cleared for confidential, secret, or top secret. Is that still in use? Ordinarily, those are markings to limit the particular universe of individuals who may have access to the information, but the three levels of classification describe essentially the sensitivity of the information. Now, if you're involved with nuclear energy, atomic nuclear, hydrogen bombs, what's the clearance on that? Well, first of all, I should point out that classification of atomic weapons and special nuclear material is not covered by our executive order on national security information. That is the exception, and that is classified under the Atomic Energy Act of 1954. And what are those particular classifications? Uh, there are two. One is called restricted data. Restricted data deals with information that pertains to the development of atomic weapons or critical nuclear material. The other is called formerly restricted data which deals uh, more particularly with the military use of atomic weapons. You're saying it's called, first category is restricted data. Restricted data. The, the other one is called formerly, F-O-R-M-E-R-L-Y, right. restricted data. It's a misleading term because it suggests it's no longer classified, but it still is classified information under the Atomic Energy Act. Now, who would decide when that information is declassified? Uh, those decisions are exclusively those of the Secretary of Energy with respect to restricted data. With respect to formally restricted data, the Secretaries of Energy and Defense act in concert. Are there any other classifications in the Department of Defense, let's say, or the Department of Energy, which produces weapons uh, for the Department of Defense, or produces the supply of nuclear and hydrogen fuel? Uh, any other classifications besides the ones you've listed? And if so, what are they? Uh, no, sir. No other type of classification? No. There are, there are programs called special access programs, but those are subsets of the existing classification programs. In other words, they'd be subsets under either top secret, secret, or confidential? That, that is correct. And in the case of atomic energy, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, the Department of Energy? Right. The, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission also uh, has the authority to classify under the Atomic Energy Act. And do they generally use the categories that you've given, or have they yes, got a they new set the, of categories? They use the same categories. Restricted Which is restricted data, data and formally restricted that data. That is correct. 
Okay, and they would have the final say as to what, or would the Secretary of Energy as to what is unrestricted with, data? With respect to information uh, specifically classified by the NRC, it would be the NRC who would have that responsibility okay. for declassification. How, how about CIA? Do you have any other classifications beyond the ones you've heard here? No, sir. Mr. Garfinkel summed it up very adequately. Uh, okay. The three major levels and the special access programs are... Okay. Now, while this hearing was going on, I had a call from an individual, and they wondered, what about unidentified flying objects? What set of restrictions is on that, and what are the labels that would be applied to those files? Well, if there are documents, and perhaps there are, uh, dealing with that subject that remain classified, again, they would fall within the executive order system, I would presume. I can't understand how they would fall within the Atomic Energy Act. And so if there is such classification remaining, uh, it would pertain to the top secret, secret or confidential information under 12958. Mm -hmm. And you, you said if such a category well, remained, are you aware I, of a category that doesn't remain but was used? Uh, no. Okay. How about CIA? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, the, the request on UFOs were uh, formally litigated under the FOIA and, and remain today one of the most popular, most numerous requests that we receive. There are very small withholdings on the body of documents the CIA had uh, all exclusively uh, to protect the identity of a source or foreign liaison, a foreign government who provided information. Um, we recently uh, released a historical uh, story on UFOs in the journal that we publish internally, Studies in Intelligence. Uh, I think it had one minor uh, snippet of classified information because it was information, if I recall correctly, had been provided by a foreign government. And that was then classified by us as top secret? No, it would have been classified confidential or secret. Okay. Uh, well, I'm trying to get on the record. Are, are there any other categories of which the two of you are knowledgeable that we have not discussed here? Okay. Not with which I'm knowledgeable. All right. Well, we'll ask some other people also. We're, we're going to get into a series on that. But uh, now I'm curious just what your knowledge is as to what, say, some of our allies do when it comes to human rights. For example, we had East Germany and we had West Germany. Then, to everybody's surprise, they combined years ahead of what everybody expected. Now, what has happened on the East German side in terms of members of the communist, members who were helping the in the power communist party, now that it's a united Germany, do we know how they treat sort of human rights violations that went on under the communists in East Germany? And uh, I just wondered, uh, and don't limit yourself to Germany, but other similar situations. You have the same in Russia now, where the files of the KGB, I believe, are open in some respects. And what do they do to handle the type of questions that came up as to what we should do? Is there anything done by our allies in NATO in this regard? Uh, or it would be, uh, say, occupied France and the Pataan government, and then de Gaulle comes in, and if they have the files, how did they handle human rights questions? I just wonder if either one of you has a thought on that. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I don't know any more than uh, what I have uh, read in the, the media. I understand that the German government has opened some of the files that were formerly maintained by East German intelligence on its own citizens and that uh, you can examine those files. Um, many of the European countries do have some type of a Freedom of Information Act. Uh, however, my limited knowledge is that uh, most, if not all of those, also have uh, national security exemptions, much like our own FOIA. Mm -hmm. Mr. Garfinkel. Mr. Chairman, I could only reply in the general with respect to access laws internationally rather than in the specific to the issue of human rights records because I, I don't have the answer to that particular question. I, I noted in my testimony that we are at the forefront 
in our freedom of information laws and in our declassification program. Uh, it's been my privilege since I've served in my current position to meet with foreign statesmen and students and journalists and I, I can say without any hesitancy that I'm misspeaking that we are far in the forefront in freedom of information and access to records of governance uh, within the United States. Uh, my last question, then I'll yield to the gentleman from Ohio. Uh, Mr. Garfinkel is Executive Secretary for the Interagency Security Classification Appeals Panel. What are your thoughts on adding two new non-governmental members to the appeals panel as would be required in the Lantos uh, legislation, H.R. 2635? Do you have any comments on that one way or the other? I'm not prepared to address the administration's position on whether or not that would be a worthy idea. I suspect that representatives of the Department of Justice, for example, may have some concerns, separation of powers concerns or other legal concerns with that, but I'm not prepared to address it. I can tell you that as executive secretary of that panel, we have been very successful in declassifying a very large percentage of information that has come before us on appeal uh, with the government representatives who are currently on that panel. Let me ask you, Mr. Strickland, on that question, does CIA's presidential oversight group that's existed, I think, since probably uh, President Truman. Uh, do they handle any of these matters, or, or is there a separate group within CIA that either has, do they have any outsiders that sit on that separate group? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, any classification decisions at CIA that a requester wishes to appeal would go to the ICAP, the Interagency Security Classification Appeals Panel. That's the one of distinguished citizens that various presidents appoint to that role. Is that correct? Uh, no. 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 No, that's the interagency panel that I'm the executive I secretary see. of. Okay. Okay, so you deal strictly with Mr. Garfinkel on that those is correct. matters then. But you'd have a recommendation coming from the appropriate sections within CIA, I assume, as to whether that file should be released or not. Yes, sir. We have, a, uh, we have a process which is evolving. A requester, a citizen who makes a request under the executive order, uh, he or she makes the request, has an administrative appeal inside the agency, and then under the executive order may take an appeal to this interagency panel that Mr. Garfinkel described, of which he is the executive secretary. And uh, we then have a very senior level review. Uh, indeed, our executive director or deputy executive director uh, generally considers the information at issue, and um, then a, a, uh, the panel considers the arguments, pros and cons, and arrives at a decision. Uh, thank you. I ran a little over. Uh, I'll give uh, my distinguished colleague from Ohio, Mr. Kucinich, 12 minutes of questioning. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I, I want to thank the gentleman for appearing before this committee. And I understand, uh, Mr. Strickland, with respect to the CIA, you have a very difficult job. And, you know, I think all Americans can appreciate the difficulty uh, the CIA has in being able to gather information uh, relative to U.S. interests abroad and to be able to uh, protect sources and to be able to serve this country. I, you know, it should be said that your work is appreciated. Now, I, I, of course, you understand our responsibility here, which is to find out if other concerns merit attention, such as human rights. I happen to believe they do. I also understand that in your role as a CIA representative, that there's been many different versions of the CIA over the uh, history of its existence, and that uh, we're not asking you to have to vouch for previous directors, previous practices of the CIA, uh, simply to try to help us as we try to make government more responsive. And, and again, I, so we established the context of this meeting here. Now in that, 
in that light. Uh, does the State Department ever intercede with you and ask you not to release information? Uh, no, sir. Uh, the, the process on... Do they ever intercede with anybody at the CIA and ask them not to receive information? Are there any conferences between State and the CIA on the release of information? No, they have never interceded, to my knowledge, and asked that we not release information. Let me just very briefly explain the process by which these special searches, we term them special searches, are conducted. Uh, typically, the NSC will convene a working level meeting where there will be representatives of the Department of Defense, State, CIA, NSA, where we will receive the tasking, decide as a committee, if you will, uh, what would be the most expeditious way to proceed, and then each agency goes back to its respective home and proceeds to conduct the necessary searches and reviews. Uh, we necessarily, of course, coordinate. Uh, I might have a cable which has embassy reporting on it, so I would not be free to, to release that without coordinating it with state. Uh, conversely, the Department of State might have a cable having CIA information they would coordinate that paragraph. But I certainly am never aware of any case where uh, they have asked or, or vice versa any type of withholding decision that way. Did you have any uh, conversation with people at State or the Department of Defense about whether they were going to be here today or not? No, sir, I did not. So you weren't aware they weren't going to appear? No, sir, I was only, to be honest, I was just uh, focusing on on my work here preparing for the committee and uh, that was certainly my focus. Thank you. I would like to uh, uh, get into this uh, issue of the release of uh, documents on General Alvarez um, uh, to the uh, release to the Honduran Human Rights Commissioner in response to his request for information. Uh, I have here the redacted uh, version of the um, uh, documents which were requested. I heard your testimony saying that you felt that this uh, was responsive to the request. And I'm, uh, as, I, as I go over uh, these documents, a few things occur to me. Uh, first of all, they seem to uh, have a great deal to do with attempts on the life of General Alvarez, but uh, there seems to be very little about his actions on human rights violations. Uh, let it be said that, that uh, I think all of us would agree that the attempt on anyone's life is abhorrent. And we, we uh, must make sure that we never support anyone getting hurt anywhere. But, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, as I'm looking at, at this redacted version and looking at the request that was made, uh, which I have a copy of here, uh, The request was for uh, records which mention Alvarez in reference to the use of kidnapping, disappearance, and torture against, uh, quote, unquote, subversive groups or individuals, and in reference to violations of human rights, extra legal operations, activities of death squads, and the maintenance of clandestine jails. Now, I, I, I look at the request. I look at your redacted version. And again, I don't see that much which is responsive to the specifics uh, of that particular request about the scope of his activities. Now, uh, what that leads me to believe, and, and as I've heard you testify, and, 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 I, and I believe you're telling the truth. I just want you to know that. I believe you're telling me the truth as you know it. However, uh, it occurs to me from your testimony that it's quite possible that uh, General Alvarez was not under CIA surveillance. Because if he was under CIA surveillance, I think that you would have a volume of information here which would be very useful. I believe you would produce that for this committee, although heavily redacted it might be. Or even denied if necessary. Or denied if necessary. But, but what occurs to me from hearing your testimony is that at that time, we're not talking about present day, that has to be known. But at that time, the CIA was gathering information to protect General Alvarez from whoever his assailants may be. But similarly, because there are no records that have been made available, 
it's quite possible that the CIA wasn't actually watching General Alvarez. I would think that's a fair assumption. Uh, and so it may be that such records may, are not available because they may, in fact, not exist. Not exist. Correct, sir. I, as I mentioned, the, I believe the most notable information that we released that I can recall was uh, several instances where the cable reports that General Alvarez had decided that the Honduran legal system was totally inefficient and had decided to use extra legal or extra judicial means against the country or the military opponents. And uh, that, is the, that is quite honestly the totality of the relevant information. Now, now let me tell you, however, the implications of your testimony. And again, I'm not speaking of you personally. I'm speaking of the CIA as was operative uh, during the uh, uh, activities of General Alvarez. It occurs to me that the implications of your testimony are as follows. Since the CIA is without a doubt the most effective intelli intelligence gathering organization that the world has ever known, since the CIA has some of the best trained people located as operatives all over the world, since the CIA spares no expense to the extent of their budget in finding out what's going on, since all those things are true and, and would unlikely not be disputed by certainly anyone representing the CIA, then what follows is they look the other way when General Alvarez was, was going around killing people. Now, I'm not asking you to respond to that. I'm going to spare you the, uh, the chance to respond to that. I'm simply telling you what the implications are here. That the CIA is actually implicated in General Alvarez's conduct because there's no information that can be produced to the contrary, especially when you can produce reams of information about the people who were going after General Alvarez. So the, the incompleteness of this raises the gravest questions about what exactly the CIA was doing, and it seems to me implicates the CIA in General Alvarez's conduct. Now, I just, you know, it's not hard to put two and two together. We're not talking about the X files here. We're talking about the Y files why the CIA would not have any information on the activities of General Alvarez when tens of thousands of people were murdered. It just seems to me to be so implausible as to create the only plausible conclusion that the CIA knew about it. Now, again, I am not asking you to respond. I will not press you on that. You were not uh, making those decisions at that time. I will, however, refer you to a letter uh, signed by President Clinton to uh, Morton Halperin, the chair of the advisory board of the Center for National Security Studies. I think Mr. Garfinkel is probably uh, familiar with this letter, where the president writes on December 1st, 1977, uh, my administration strongly supports the work of the Guatemala Historical Clarification Committee and is committed to helping the Commission fulfill its mission. It goes on to say, we will be as responsive as possible, consistent with the current declassification guidelines to assist the Commission in carrying out its important duties. It goes on to say, we are committed to sharing with Honduran authorities all appropriate information about past human rights cases. And goes on to say that the CIA will release human rights material, human rights related material on General Alvarez in the next few weeks, and on Battalion 316 by year's end. The latter will include the Inspector General's report. Goes on to say, as a result, the Defense Department expects to have a second group of documents ready for release by year's end. We've established what you've released with respect to um, General Alvarez. Uh, we've established there is a, a strong feeling that uh, it's incomplete, but I will allow that the documents may not exist. I will ask you, though, what about Battalion 316? Do you know anything about Battalion 316? 
we are completing that. For, that's the fourth segment of Dr. Valadera's request, uh, Battalion 316 and the 1997 Inspector General's report. Um, as I recall, it is a limited number of documents. Uh, once again, the focus was Battalion 316 and human rights violations. Uh, I don't recall uh, at the moment the exact number of documents, but it is not a large number. But you will pursue that? Yes, sir. We have that, that release, I would expect, in a matter of weeks. It is almost completed. And you take this request very seriously, I take it? Yes, indeed. And you're following the President's directive? Yes, sir. Uh, I would uh, like to ask Mr. Uh, Garfinkel. I, I, uh, staff has prepared a, um, a chart here on a classification activity by agency which shows that uh, the averages for all classification activity, original and derivative, from 1990 to 1995, as reported by the Information Security Oversight Office and the DOE, as compiled by the Commission on Protecting and Reducing Government Secrecy. And what it shows here is, a, um, uh, is the Department of Defense uh, leading all agencies in classification. Uh, also, in looking at the, uh, by far. Also, it shows, um, as I went into the budget information on the agency's reporting security classification cost estimates for fiscal year 19. Uh, 97, the Department of Defense has $3.1 billion uh, budgeted for that uh, security classification, which seems to exceed by more than 10 times all the other security classification requirements of uh, uh, the departments put together, all the other departments put together. Uh, I, the, the question is, uh, Mr. Garfinkel, uh, is this uh, issue of uh, classification out of control? Are, are, are we over-classifying uh, and then in increasingly uh, increasing the problem of trying to declassify? I think we over-classify a lot less today than we have in the past. And even in the past, I think that our experience in reviewing large numbers of classified information revealed to us that overclassification, even at its worst, uh, was probably a matter of 10 percent of the information or less. Uh, there was a reference in earlier testimony to the culture of secrecy, and it's become common to suggest that the reason for overclassification is the intent of individuals to cover up, to prevent embarrassment. Uh, as the director of an office that used to review and still reviews thousands of classified decisions each year, we saw very little of that. What we did see was overclassification by what we would call rote. We classify now because we classified the same information before. And this is a very difficult, this is a culture of secrecy well, that's, in fact. Actually, Mr. Garfield, that's the, that's a precise point. It's uh, overclassification by rote. I would just like to conclude with this, Mr. Chairman, uh, and thank you for the time. Um, in uh, Mr. Strickland's testimony, you mentioned about concern that the legislation which is before us would ensure, and this is a quote, that foreign nationals will not continue to cooperate with American intelligence on human rights and other issues. I would hope, uh, as the CIA tries to be responsive in this new world, post-Cold War world, that you will keep in mind the human rights concerns of those who are not CIA operatives, but simply citizens in far-flung lands where we have operatives who might be suffering human rights abuses because they stand up for workers' rights, because they stand up for free speech, because they stand up for democracy. If the CIA can do that, 
and make a transition to include broad-based concerns on human rights, uh, then the CIA will indeed be uh, embarking on a new era which allows you to be protectors of human rights and not simply observers who uh, cannot uh, uh, become involved in any way as uh, human rights abuses take place. I know you have good information. We just want to make sure that it is applied in a level way which gives all parties to uh, human rights uh, abuses an opportunity for uh, oversight and gives all victims of human rights abuse an opportunity for justice. And I thank you for your appearance and Mr. Garfinkel's appearance. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We thank you. And just a few closing questions I have. I'd raise the question about uh, how does the Germans handle this? And uh, one of our bright staff members here, uh, the executive director of the Congressional Bipartisan Caucus on Human Rights, says the Germans have set up what's called uh, the Gauch office, because it's headed by Bishop Gauch. And any individual in East Germany can come in and see what was in their file while the secret police of the East German communists uh, was collecting things their neighbors said about them and all the rest of it. That was the organization or office that I was referring to, yeah. Mr. Chairman. So that's one way to certainly handle this. Uh, I have a couple of just closing questions. I'm curious on CIA, how have the internal classifications that were put on the record here uh, changed as a result of the end of the Cold War in any way, or are the classification system still valid given the other types of work you do. I just wonder, by title, I'm thinking, is there a, a category of information that is put in the top secret, secret confidential, the, if you use the atomic energy one, the restricted, uh, the formally restricted, and so forth? Mr. Chairman, I don't believe it has changed uh, significantly. For example, human source information is almost exclusively ca uh, classified at the secret level. It may be very tightly compartmented, depending on the country that it is from, uh, but it is invariably at the secret level, for example. Okay, so there haven't been any changes, or have there been any? Certainly the number of original, uh, and Mr. Garfinkel can probably also have some information on this, the number of original decisions have dropped rather dramatically. Uh, we rely very uh, heavily on a classification guide, which is promulgated by the DCI. And the purpose of that guide is to ensure consistency among all of our employees and the minimum level of classification that's appropriate for the individual, for the, for the information at issue. Uh, what you want to do, avoid is having each one of hundreds or thousands of employees making their own individual ad hoc decision. So that's why a classification guide is very important. And I think that the vast, vast majority of our decisions are now derivative based on that guide. The number of original decisions are very low. In terms of particular sources now, uh, after those sources die, is any of that information likely to be released? Because we have had that policy, as I recall, in the early part of the century or the Spanish-American War, the First World War. I remember getting a file on the Zimmerman telegram, for example, as to who had it and who didn't have it and so forth. But that was the 1950s, and that was a significant factor in part of the First World War. Two points, or two points I think would be relevant there, uh, sir. First, we only withhold that information provided by a source which would tend to identify the source. So the first cut is, to the extent we can, we release information provided by the source. Uh, the second part of your question, uh, what about the age or whether the source is alive or whether the source still is in country? Uh, we don't see a major difference uh, based on their age or their immediate vulnerability because of issues such as family, friends, associates. Uh, foreign intelligence services, it's our judgment, are not moved by the fact that the individual may have moved to a third country or may even be dead. Just as this country is concerned whenever we find evidence of, of espionage or treason. So it is certainly a, a matter, even if the source has moved away, even if the source is deceased, there may be danger. Now, quite clearly, at some point in time, 
that danger becomes so remote that it's not necessary to protect the person anymore. Uh, but for the average document that we are dealing with, the source protection is a very uh, real issue. I mentioned an example in the JFK uh, arena where we have a source that's now living in a third country. Well, we are concerned because not only is that source vulnerable, but perhaps, and, and I would think certainly, the family and friends that remain behind are vulnerable. Now, at what day or event does that end? I, I don't know at, at, at the moment, but it is certainly a continuing concern for us. Do we have any treaties or agreements to the knowledge of either of you that our government has engaged in with foreign governments that would prevent the release of information referred to in Mr. Lantis's bill, H.R. 2635? The only the possibly relevant point there would be that if any foreign government had provided us information, there is an agreement or treaty obligation between our government and that other government regarding the secrecy or protection of their information. Would we have to go back to that government if we wanted to see a change in a particular document that had been given under those circumstances? Very possibly. Okay. Uh, do we know of too many governments, uh, or do we know of any government to which that applies now? Not, I, I'm, I'm not certain of any particular uh, case at the moment. Um, again, just I would rely on our examples with the JFK. It is not unusual for us to go back to foreign governments with respect to information we have on the JFK and get their feeling for the releasability of the information. So I would assume that that same model and, and same frequency of activity would, would happen here. Mr. Garfinkel, are you familiar with any agreements that we have between, say, the archives or the executive branch and foreign governments that would preclude release of various documents because there might be foreign sources? Uh, I'm not familiar with any specific agreements, but that's not to say that they don't exist. Uh, there are large number of agreements between our government and other governments that uh, like Mr. Strickland said, uh, preclude our release of their information without their consent. Uh, but at the same time, we have released foreign government information that is not covered by such agreements when we felt uh, that the other standards of the executive order were met for declassification. Uh, thank you on that answer. Uh, as uh, one of the witnesses noted earlier, government secrecy comes at a price, and that price includes a heavy drain on the budgets and the staff of the federal executive branch. That price also includes depriving the press, other citizens, and even foreign countries of information they may seek or may need. Uh, no one argues that we should simply refuse to pay the price. Some government documents must be kept secret based on the source and other things like that. And the real question is, by what criteria? And are these criteria established? Are they being faithfully carried out? That's certainly uh, the relevant committees, be it the Intelligence Committee or this committee, which can go anywhere based on economy and efficiency. Uh, the challenge we face is to minimize the cost. And uh, I think we need to reevaluate our classification and declassification policies just in general with the end of the Cold War era and see if we can strike a better balance. And hopefully today's hearing will be a step toward that uh, goal. And uh, we will be considering the Lantos bill in a uh, markup in the next couple of weeks. And we would welcome uh, any further comments either of you might have as you look line by line in that bill. And uh, any further comments the executive branch and the president and the administration might have. And with that, I thank you both for being brave souls that did show up when a lot of your colleagues are either eating a decent lunch in a gourmet restaurant uh, or they're just escaping us. 
and uh, we will be getting the Department of State and the OMB to coordinate uh, as they would uh, within the executive branch to see where they stand on these things and what they're doing, but uh, that is another story. I want to thank the people that arranged this hearing. Uh, the chair, chair, would the chair yield? Yeah. Uh, I, I just, uh, b before you uh, conclude the hearing, everything you've got in the record. I, I have, uh, thank you, from the Religious Task yeah. Force on Central American Mexico, a statement yeah. relative to this. Uh, two statements, actually, and also one from the office of the um, Archbishop of Guatemala and some articles, uh, on, uh, another statement from the Washington office on Latin America and a news article uh, unredacted from the New York Times op-ed of uh, April 8, 1988 and another one from uh, the New York Times, uh, April 9, 1998. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, they'll be put without objection in the record to where you had your last questioning because they're relevant to that questioning. Uh, let me thank the staff that's uh, been involved in this on both sides. Uh, J. Russell George, our staff director and general counsel. Uh, John Hines to my left and your right, professional staff member responsible for this hearing, along with Randy Kaplan, who's uh, behind him, professional staff member. Our uh, clerk, uh, Matthew Ebert, and a staff assistant, uh, Mason Allinger. And for the minority, we have Faith Weiss, the minority counsel. Uh, we have Hans uh, Hofgraf, the legislative assistant to Representative Lantos and executive director of the Congressional Human Rights Caucus. Uh, Early Green, staff assistant, Jean Gosa, minority clerk, and then our court reporters, uh, Cindy Sebo and Judith Mazur. Lisa Chamberlain. And Lisa, Lisa Chamberlain. Yes, we'd record, we would love to have a list from the Democratic side so we don't have to strain our imagination all the time. Thank you. Uh, and with that, this meeting is adjourned. Congressman Stephen Horn and the other members of the subcommittee will join their colleagues on the House floor tomorrow at 12.30 p.m. for morning hour speeches and at 2 for legislative business. Later in the day, Congressman Dan Burton plans to come to the floor.